Okay. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Gregory Vadis, Chief of the FCC's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Welcome to this fourth of the series of webinars we started in May 2010 on FCC issues of interest to state and local governments. First, I would like to thank our partners in state and local governments and the national organizations representing them for both spreading the word about our biannual webinars and for participating in them. Without you, we would not be having this event today, so thank you for your virtual presence. We hope you find this webinar worth your time and we look forward to your active participation in it. I also want to thank each of our speakers today. First from our Chairman's Office, Josh Gottheimer, who will be here shortly. They will be followed by staff from our bureaus in wireline competition, public safety, homeland security, media, wireless telecommunications, and consumer and governmental affairs. These expert FCC staff members will first speak with you and then answer your questions about such topics as advancing digital literacy and combat, combating stolen cell phones, reforming, modernization, mod, reforming and modernizing lifeline phone service for low-income Americans, Next Generation 911 and the creation of, new, of a new public safety network, incentive broadcast spectrum auctions as they relate to state-owned networks, co-location and signal boosters both for improved wireless coverage, and finally, two recent policy pri priorities of the FCC's consumer empowerment agenda. Stronger regulation of cramming, which is the placement of unauthorized charges on consumer phone bills, and robocalls, those automated, pre-recorded, and often unwanted phone calls we receive at dinner time. Finally, I would like to recognize other FCC staff who also helped make today's presentation possible. First, Gray Brooks of the FCC social media team. Second, my staff in the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, my deputy Steve Klitzman, and staff attorneys Elizabeth Muma, Carmen Scanlon, and Amy Carlton. Now for the logistics. Well, for those of you on live stream, we're up and running. Uh, we're having a little glitch with our WebEx, but hopefully that'll be up in a few minutes. So I encourage anybody who's on live stream right now to go ahead and register, to please register on the WebEx. That way we could capture your email address for our distribution list and let you know what's happening at the commission um, on items that really are of interest to state and local governments. So uh, please register for WebEx in a few minutes as soon as that goes up, and we apologize for the delays. Um, uh, some more on logistics. We ask that you relate, you relate all questions just to the topics on today's agenda. Uh, so that's where we have the expert, expert speakers from. Uh, the agenda is posted at FCC.gov slash events. As is all the other inf as are all the other logistical informa information. Um, if you're listening via the phone bridge, we also encourage you to send questions to live questions at fcc.gov, or you could tweet them in at hashtag uh, FCC Live. Again, all this uh, all this technical information is on the uh, FCC events page. If you're um, if you are listening, uh, if you're participating via uh, web stream. We ask that you uh, send us an uh, uh, email to livequestions at FCC.gov with the word registration in the subject line, and that way we could get your email address. Uh, it, hopefully the WebEx will be working, but uh, in case it's not, again, send questions to livequestions at FCC.gov with the word registration in the subject line. And if you want to send us any questions, you could do the same, livequestions at FCC.gov, and we ask that you put the word question in the subject line. And now I'm pleased to call on Josh Gottheimer, Senior Counsel from Chairman Janikowski's office. He will speak with you about two current policy priorities of the Chairman, advancing digital literacy and com combating stolen cell phones. Josh. Thanks, Frank. Josh, thanks for joining us again, and thanks for making uh, state and local governments a priority for the Chairman's office. And we thank Chairman Janikowski. Uh, it's our pleasure, and, uh, and this is a very, very important audience for for us here at the FCC, and, and Greg, your work is excellent, and, and the Bureau, I really want to thank CGB and the Consumer Bureau for all the work that it does every day to help make sure that what we do here in Washington isn't just, uh, doesn't just ring true in, in these hallways, but, um, but actually gets out to where the best ideas come from, where people are living on the ground and doing, doing the work every day. So hopefully today's conversation will help in that regard, get some information out about some policies that are happening here at the FCC uh, that have come out of very close coordination and work with 
with both companies and, and uh, uh, some of our public sector friends across government, also non-governmental organizations uh, that have played a very important role in developing the ideas here that, that uh, have come to be. So with that, why don't we get into it a little bit? So if I just flip on this, everyone can see what we're looking at. Greg? Yep. Great. Uh, and then questions will come in afterwards. Is that how this yeah, will work? Uh, yeah, questions will be Sorry. coming in. People could tweet them at any time or email them, and we'll try to save them for the end of your presentation. Excellent. So go ahead and go through your presentation. Great. So the, the first topic to, to talk about is uh, broadband and, and digital literacy. The, uh, the core idea here um, uh, is that you've and, and the real challenge that Chairman Janikowski, when he came into came into office a few years ago, uh, what was was front and center uh, challenge that uh, that was facing the commission and the country, and as he developed with a team the America's first national broadband plan, um, uh, there was there was a, a piece that stuck out um, in all of our planning, and there was an unfortunate issue that. The agency had to grapple with, and uh, if we were going to make sure that our country, or the U.S., was as competitive as it should be, and that was continued to lead the pack uh, uh, and lead the world in broadband, um, uh, wired and wireless, the and make sure that all of our citizens had uh, were able to take advantage of of the incredible developments that were happening in the space, both for education and for healthcare, but for getting a job and finding a job and for making sure that our businesses and our companies, large and small, were able to take advantage of not just what was happening on their street, but what was happening on the online main street and, and being part of, of this global economy and making sure that we utilized all of, of, of the benefits of being part of this. You can't, one of the things that was very clear to us was that you can't um, maximize that benefit uh, if you have a third of the country that's not adopting broadband at home. Um, and you can't maximize that benefit if 66 million Americans are not digitally literate. Uh, for, for, and, and obviously those numbers are daunting when you have a third of the country unconnected at home, um, but ones that we said, daunting as they are, we have to figure out what's behind them and what should we do about it. Um, uh, there's three big obstacles that we know about um, uh, for broadband, of, for, for failure to adopt broadband. Um, one, and, I, and I'll talk about these and we'll come back to them uh, in a minute, but one is the cost of the connectivity, as you might imagine, being connected at home uh, has a cost with it, and um, uh, for lots of Americans, uh, it's out of their price range, or uh, the second barrier is they don't understand from a relevancy standpoint why it's important to be connected at home. They don't see the rich benefits for finding a job or getting a job or connecting with friends and family or uh, accessing for their children all the wonderful benefits of education online. Uh, if you're for an older American, getting the, the benefits of, of the information you can find online or, or whether that's finding medical help or getting certain guidance or connecting with your government to get forms or information. Um, um, uh, so the second roadblock that research has been found on is is this relevance uh, piece. And the third roadblock with cost and relevance um, is digital literacy. Um, uh, and uh, what we found, as I was just said a minute ago, is you've got 66 million Americans who were not digitally literate. Um, and we realized that our country, while doing many good things across communities, uh, could do more on the digital, liter front, digital literacy front. So with that, I, I, yeah, I, the slide you're looking at it now just gives you a little more meat on the bone of what we're talking about. When you have Americans adopt this benchmark where it's 90% in Singapore and Korea, um, where there's 90% adoption at home. I mentioned a minute ago the, the barriers, and you can see them clearly here, to, to non-adoption. Uh, non um, one, the digital literacy piece. Uh, the two, the cost, uh, you get a sense of, of the stats here. Three, the relevance. Um, um, and and, and this, the marketing piece is very closely tied to the relevancy piece uh, because they're ju we're just not getting the information out through the appropriate channels of why it's important to connect and, and how to connect. Um, uh, so I, I talked broadly about the, the why it's so important. This gives you a little more information, and we can post this 
and make sure you can, if you want to spend a little more time reading this um, about and look at some of the statistics. But let's talk about a few of them very quickly. Um, the digital literacy and uh, connectivity piece for jobs and economic opportunity. Um, um, it, it's it's. If you look at the statistic at the bottom of the left, it says, which to me is a very um, daunting statistic, 77 in the, in the next decade, 77% of jobs in this country will require some sort of digital skills. What does that mean? It means that if you're one of the 66 million Americans who's digitally literate, uh, it's going to be very difficult for you to be part of the economy. Why? Getting a job at Target or Walmart today, you need to apply online or at a digital kiosk in their store. What does this mean? It means if you are digitally literate and don't know how to get online or to use a mouse or to use a computer, you are at a significant disadvantage. And again, at all job levels. It's not the same you know, that it was 10 years ago where you had certain jobs that were, um, where digital skills were essential. Now, unfortunately, it is a much more across the board issue. Um, so if you're not connected or if you don't have the skills, in many ways it, the broadband divide is a very dark place being on the other side of that divide. And it hurts our country, uh, not just for because you're not able to maybe get a job or maximize your potential, but it hurts us as a, con as a country competitively. The second big barrier, education, um, the barrier of, of failure to adopt. Digital textbooks and uh, and uh, the internet-based homework is will be much more of the norm than the exception in the coming years. We know that you have a 6 to 8% higher graduation rate if you're connected uh, and if you're connected at home. We can't, again, on the education side, leave swaths of people out when 80% of K-12 teachers are giving homework, internet-based homework. And the third reason, and these are, again, just a few reasons, uh, there are many more, is health care and, um, and e-government. Um, again, uh, the benefits there are clear, and being unconnected is an issue. So one of the things, and we've done several, uh, under Chairman Janikowski, taken several steps at the commission um, to combat these obstacles to adoption. One that uh, we're very excited about was uh, several partners came to us um, and said we'd like to figure out a way to deal with these obstacles. Uh, let's talk about cost first. The, the cable companies, um, which cover 86% of the uh, geographic map, um, are offering 995, will be offering starting this fall, back to school, 995 plus tax broadband to the home for those who do not subscribe already and who are school lunch eligible. Um, uh, so if you do not have broadband at home already and uh, you are in that footprint, you can get 995 plus tax broadband compared to $40 a month nationally as the national average price. That's a huge benefit, an enormous benefit. It's a multi-billion dollar benefit that the cable industry uh, uh, agreed to offer. Um, on th uh, that takes one piece of the cost equation off the table. The other big piece is the computer or the device itself. So it's wonderful if you have uh, uh, connectivity into the home, but if you have no, nothing to connect it to, well, it doesn't really help you much. So um, one of the largest refurbishers in the country, a company called Redemtech, is offering business-grade computers around two years old uh, shipped to the home for laptops and desktops for $150, including Microsoft full suite of Microsoft Office and Windows 8. Uh, Windows 7 now will be Windows 8 on the device with warranty and tech support for $150. Two big cost obstacles that hopefully will deal with that obstacle to adoption of cost. Um, on the relevance piece, many companies, you see some of them here from Discovery uh, uh, to Odesk uh, to down the line of uh, to uh, Career Builder um, um, and other job finding engines are putting forth a ton of content that, that would normally be associated with a cost, um, including job training uh, online uh, for free for low-income Americans. The third big barrier, as we talked about, is digital literacy. So uh, it's an area where we should spend a, a, a minute because we believe that this is a place that people are not, there's a lot of resources out there that are not being taken advantage of. 
basic digital literacy, how to use a mouse, how to get an email account, how to surf the web. So what do you do about this? One, you've got to get basic skills out. Um, uh, Thirty. 3% of America's public libraries, uh, 30, sorry, 38% of America's public libraries offer basic digital training, literacy training in their libraries. Um, and so it's in a, a huge swath of communities. It's just a matter of taking advantage of them. Um, Best Buy, uh, many of you probably know uh, the company, they have uh, agreed to offer, put their geek squad up, which are their people who teach skills, um, and help people get computer support. They've offered uh, in a bunch of states, uh, I believe it's 15 or 20 states, offered to put to do basic digital literacy training there. We're also <coughs> working with a slew of partners from 4-H to United Way to the Urban League to LULAC um, around the country to also teach basic digital literacy training, and a lot of them have it already. In the fall, there will be an engine, a search engine that comes out that can be accessed by dialing an 800 number or by going online to connectcompete.org um, where you'll be able to enter in your zip code and you'll find out where the nearest digital literacy training is. I really encourage you and I hope you'll get the word out both about the 995 broadband and the $150 computers, again, for school lunch families, plus the digital literacy training and, find, and word out in your communities that these resources exist. The Connect to Compete, which is now an independent organization stood up outside of government as a nonprofit, has $4 billion worth of uh, resources that's been committed to it. The real question is, and again, we're in Washington, you're doing the real work out in the country. The real question is, will people take advantage of it? Can we get the word out to our schools, to our PTA, to our PTAs, to, and through our local libraries, through our local organizations, through mayor's offices and, and down from governor's offices down to let people know that this exists and there's rich resources to deal with uh, uh, getting the word out. On the marketing side, we will have a page up with fly that you can download flyers and get the word out uh, and, and the kits and packets and resources the question will be just, will people take advantage of it and get, get the word into the schools and their communities? And that's critical. Um, on the offerings, uh, uh, it's this, I, I want you to just have this page. I just went over it with you a minute ago. But this is a page that you can hopefully download and know what's available and get out to your communities. It would be very much appreciated. And then you can, when the when this thing launches in the fall, you can go to connectcompete.org now and, and sign up to get information when it launches. But when it launches in back to school time, um, can we get the word out and make sure the communities know that this exists? Um, uh, one other thing in this area on the digital literacy, something called the Digital Literacy Core, the FCC has proposed um, using some savings from another program through USF, Universal Service Fund Reform, that's happened recently here at the agency under the chairman, to take part of the savings, and there was, uh, there was a very good amount of savings from, from reforming the program, to put, toward forming, to put toward more money for digital literacy on the ground. I talked a minute ago about the training that was happening in libraries and schools where you've got 38% of them doing basic digital literacy training. We th we'd love to get that number closer to 60%. Um, we've proposed putting $50 million a year or a number in that neighborhood toward uh, digital literacy trainers. We call them digital literacy core. Um, we are developing and working with Connecting PETA curriculum to get to all schools, to get to libraries, to help that, to help as guidance, sort of a guideline of what, what digital literacy training could look like and should look like. If, uh, but again, this just would be some guidance, not a directive, um, uh, just to be helpful. If you want to do digital literacy, basic digital literacy in your communities and it's not happening, please let Greg or the, the Consumer Bureau know that you're interested. Very happy to get you information on the whole Connecting Me program, um, what's available, plus uh, kits, plus uh, finding out uh, what, would, what it takes to get basic digital literacy in your community, Tr how to get training. Best Buy and Microsoft have offered to train other trainers. They're going to do trainings. Um, uh, will you uh, 
help in that? Will you help be part of that effort? I know if I can ask anything today, I, I would ask of that. We, it's it's too important uh, for our country. Um, uh, um, the second piece that I know, Greg, you wanted me to talk about uh, was stolen cell phones. Uh, that is the crassest segue I've ever had um, <laughs> from uh, from <laughs> digital literacy and adoption to stolen cell phones. Um, uh, but uh, it's the best I can do. But well, um, we thought this was going to be um, every municipality, every state, every uh, locality, yes. county, uh, however your um, jurisdictions are set up. We know we know this is an issue that's affecting your uh, your uh, police department, public safety officers, and um, it's eating up a lot of your time. So, so we, we really wanted to hit on issues that we thought would be of use to you. So yes, no, I was only kidding. Um, this is a this is a huge issue. Uh, just like adoption and digital literacy. You know, continue to be get in the way of of uh, s- uh, making sure people adopt technology and seize all the benefits of technology um, for our economy, uh, for healthcare and education. We know that so many Americans now, because given that there are more cell phones than Americans in the United States, more more <laughs> more cell phones, more devices, smartphones, cell phones, tablets. Um, uh, you know, a, a problem that many of you probably know about, and certainly your police departments know about. Uh, because we've we've heard from many of them and been talking to them for months, is from to many police chiefs is this uh, quickly growing problem of stolen devices, um, and um, it, it is really the black market has grown exponentially. Um, we heard loudest from the police departments of New York and Chicago and D.C. Who was D.C. and New York really took the leadership effort in this. Um, their their police chiefs uh, and came to us and said, along with, with Senator Chuck Schumer from New York, and said, we've got a big problem here. The big problem is that if you steal a cell phone, you can, the, whereas you may be able to sh- call your company and shut it off, the phone is still usable. So I could just walk down and steal a cell phone, and often it's after some violent activity, take it, walk down the street, go back to the store, the carrier, you know, back to whoever, AD, Verizon, Sprint, et cetera, mobile and turn it back on after you've stolen it um, for and, and just to open the account and say I don't know my uncle gave me this and I want to turn it on for myself and the result is that you uh, have a massive black market for and for these goods and big theft you see some of the statistics here that 40 percent of all robberies in New York City now involve smartphones uh, which is just when you think about it an outrageous number um, and the stats that we've gotten from across the country are equally severe. So the we got together with the uh, major stuff with the cell phone carriers, the companies, and with the device manufacturers, so the people who make your phones, so whether that's uh, Samsung or HTC or uh, Apple um, for the iPhone, and said and, and brought the police chiefs together and said to everybody, okay, what can we do about this problem? And after uh, many, uh, uh, after a quick but intense couple of months of, of discussions, we came up with several solutions. The first is a database, and, and Europe has a version of this already um, that will be in the, fir- in the first six months in the United States and then will be global, um, uh, uh, where you can, uh, when you go and say your cell phone is stolen, it registers a unique number which already exists. Think of it as like a UPC code or a barcode on your phone. It's called IM, IMIE number uh, that you can call your when you when you report your phone stolen. It will register that number, and when someone else tries to activate that phone, it's blocked. So it in essence turns your phone into a brick or into a useless device. You can you can reverse that if the owner calls again. But if for some reason you made a mistake. Um, but the bottom line is uh, uh, it will make it uh, unusable for someone who stole it. That has a huge impact on the black market immediately, and that market is not just in the U.S., but globally. Um, and hopefully will discourage crime. Another way we uh, are taking steps in that effort is that within a period of time, you will, when you buy your phone um, uh, and first turn it on, you will get an alert. And, uh, either in the first day uh, or few, encouraging you to set a password or asking, encouraging you to do it and saying, would you like to set one? Not requiring it, but 
strongly suggesting and encouraging it. And we also are doing that through an education campaign about, about the importance of that as well. Why should you set a password? Because there are very sophisticated criminals out there who can break the passwords, but a lot of the crime is just street thugs who are stealing these devices. And if there's a password, they can't crack them. So they're not, they're, they will be useless, and that will discourage and be a big deterrent. The second benefit, of course, is that if somebody finds your phone and they can't get to your data, um, um, and obviously you don't want your data vulnerable. Um, we also want to educate users, and we're going to have an education campaign also through alerts about the ability to lock, locate, and wipe your phone. There are apps out there, applications, you know, and as part of this m massive apps economy that we're living in with all these wonderful apps that are being developed constantly, which is uh, why we want everyone to be digitally literate so they can get take the advantage of these apps. The app, the, there are many apps out there, some free, some cost money, that you can remotely lock your phone. So if your phone's stolen, you can remotely lock it. You can remotely locate it, see where it is, just in case you dropped it or find out who's got it, uh, and wipe the data off of it. Um, with this will become will be a public education campaign about around locking your phone and the importance of, of and what's going on with databases and what you do if your phone is stolen. And also the FCC will be receiving regular reports on the progress to make sure that the goals and the timetable that the carriers set and the tablet manufacturers set working with the police chiefs is actually met. Um, and there'll be also a website where uh, the FCC where that data is captured, so you make sure that everyone is held accountable. The next slide gives you a very quick sense of the summary that I mentioned in terms of the timetable. Um, um, and um, what's most important there is that we get this done. It's, it was a big move. The police chiefs are very happy and are eager to see the impact in the short run on crime. Um, uh, that's, that's the, uh, I have no awkward segues left um, uh, except to uh, Greg, go to some questions. Um, but I, I just want to take a second and, 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 again, to just thank you very much for what you do out there every day uh, running the country. Um, and uh, I hope that we at the FCC, speaking for the chairman here, uh, continue to be a good resource for you. Um, uh, and if you have ever and need anything, have any questions about what we're doing or, or challenges you see out in the community that we, we touch, um, uh, I hope we can be helpful to you, and please continue to be uh, to engage with us. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, really appreciate uh, your time in the, the chairman's office, making time for the state and local governments, which are an equal part of uh, of our system, as uh, they reminded me often. So uh, they we are. do recognize that. And I wanted, uh, for our friends, who we, we here at the uh, commission, we have an uh, intergovernmental advisory committee um, to a lot of the state and local organizations and our friends on the IAC on this call. Um, I'm repeating myself, but there, there are a lot of other folks who don't know about it. The, uh, the, the chair, um, Chairman Chenikowski, has um, appointed 15, uh, 15 representatives of state and local government um, to be on our uh, intergovernmental advisory committee. and. Um, it, it, they range from state executives, Mayor uh, Bloomberg, to uh, small counties uh, in uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina, and our, um, it, it spans the spans the country. Our vice chair is from Seattle, uh, and we have uh, representatives from Kansas. Um, so, and all different, uh, as well as three tribal representatives. So um, the IAC is working on a lot of these issues, uh, digital literacy that Josh uh, touched on. And I'd encourage you uh, to, the, to the extent that you're involved with uh, organizations such as National Association of Counties, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors, National League of Cities, International Municipal Lawyers Association, whatever, whatever the organization is, to work with your parent groups and, and funnel these um, funnel any questions also, you could funnel them directly to us, but to work with your parent groups and get them into the IAC, and the IAC is actively working on a lot of these issues, and it's something the uh, Chairman's Office takes very seriously. Uh, you know what, Josh, I think, uh, do you think that's, uh, I, we have a question from Twitter, but it's off point. Um, we got to make up a question, Lisa, so it doesn't look like no one cared what I said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, any questions, <laughs> I think? You know, I think this is now time for uh, state and local groups to go ahead and, and ask questions. You have uh, you have the chairman's office squarely in your crosshairs, so go ahead and tweet away. Uh, and uh, it could be on topic or off topic. It's fine. 
If I don't know the answer, I'll just uh, duck. Okay. Well, uh, again, I, I would uh, encourage you to call us. Uh, our number, if you want to get to me, my number is 202-418-1000. Um, uh, and, and, and call away. Yeah, it, it, and also importantly, Josh's presentation on digital literacy, there's a lot of great information. All, all that will be going up on the FCC events page uh, after, after the webinar, uh, as will all the presentations. So I encourage you to go and take a look at those PowerPoints and then get back to us with further questions. And again, the organization is connectcompete.org. Uh, uh, and uh, if you have any questions or need any information on that, let us know, or anything on the cell phone side, please uh, don't hesitate. Uh, we also are spending a lot of time on figuring out the best ways to, to bring economic development, uh, broadband-enabled economic development to communities. We could talk about that in a separate, at a separate occasion, but um, I know many of you are probably want see what's going on, the massive economic uh, boom in the in the technology space, um, uh, and there are many communities around the country that are benefiting from it. Uh, our, it's it's a, a very bright spot in our economy. The U.S. is leading the world in 4G technology and development, the, in the mobile space, um, and uh, uh, and on the app side, um, we are the envy of the world in this space, and it's because of American ingenuity and innovation, and also because of of what the steps many communities are taking to attract good talent, create talent through the universities, but also to incubate that talent and, and keep people in your communities and encourage them to, to really bring their businesses there. If you have any questions about uh, ways that you could be part, your, your towns and municipalities could be part of that uh, economic upswing if you're not, or what it takes from an infrastructure perspective or, uh, or a skills perspective, uh, that's another area that we're very happy to be a resource on. Um, and we did something recently in New Jersey on this end, and uh, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, a place where I think a lot of uh, towns and cities can be part of. Um, and uh, of course, it takes it takes good broadband access. Um, um, and you know, 98% of our our country, uh, sorry, 95% of our country has at least one choice for uh, high-speed internet to the home. We want to get that number up. That's the access side, but you still have 100 million Americans who aren't adopting even with that access. So the key is for us to converge those two, make sure that we get it everywhere and that people use it. Um, uh, and when they do, we think it'll lift all boats. So I'll, I'll close on that, Greg. Uh, thanks for again for having us. Thank you for the Consumer Bureau for your excellent work in this space, and uh, Greg, for all you do. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. We really appreciate it. Thank you again for making the time. Um, now I'd like to introduce Chris Monteith, Acting Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, who has a few welcoming remarks. Thanks, Greg and Josh. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Chris Monteith, Acting Chief of the FCC's Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. On behalf of our Bureau, as well as Chairman Jenikowski and Commissioners Clyburn and McDowell, I welcome all of you to this fourth webinar on FCC issues of interest to and with impact on our partners in state and local governments. Um, my role today really is to do a quick plug for the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, for the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, and for these webinars as well as to reiterate how much we appreciate um, working with you and how much, as Josh said, we, we would like to be a resource. <clears throat> as some of you may know, I previously served as Deputy Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau uh, when the Commission first created the Bureau in 2002. And in that capacity, I managed the FCC's first Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, so I'm very aware of the importance of maintaining and strengthening positive and mutually beneficial relations between state and local governments and the FCC. <clears throat> I also may have had prior contact with some of you working in uh, the state attorney general's offices, the PUC or, or consumer protection offices when I served as chief of the FCC's enforcement bureau for a number of years. <clears throat> This afternoon, we continue our series of biannual webinars in which we bring you the wisdom and expertise of some of the most knowledgeable FCC staff, and you really do have um, experts here that will talk to you on these various issues. Uh, they will bring you up to date on current communications issues before the FCC of most relevance to state and local governments. 
We believe these webinars are an excellent example of effective, efficient, and streamlined government that help both that help both the federal government and state and local governments cut back on unnecessary travel costs in this time of fiscal belt tightening. And I really applaud uh, Greg and the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs for um, their all their work on the webinars and their vision in setting these up. This is something that um, <clears throat> Greg, under his excellent leadership, came up with, and they've been a huge Thanks. success. Um, these webinars offer us both the opportunity to communicate with each other without having to travel and without the cost um, associated with that. Uh, before I turn the webinar back over to Greg, I do want to say how much I'm looking forward to today's discussion and invite you to ask questions. Um, I think that's part of the value here, is to be able to ask questions of the group of speakers. Um, and again, I want to reiterate that, as Josh said, as Greg has said, that we are a resource for you. Um, <clears throat> we're particularly interested in knowing how we can um, improve our interactions, how we can help you to address um, the important issues that you say, see day in and day out um, and make this a, um, a great relationship from both of our pers perspectives. Um, I thank the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. There's great talent here, Steve and Emmett and Elizabeth, Greg, Carmen, Gail. Um, they're all here to help. So with that, I will turn it back over to Greg. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we appreciate uh, all the support we get from the Bureau, from yourself, everybody else, or Deputy Mark Stone. Uh, I did want to let everybody know um, that our uh, WebEx page is up and running, so I encourage you, even if you are on live stream, to go ahead and please register via WebEx so we can capture your email address for our distribution list. Um, it's pretty helpful. And uh, next up on the agenda is uh, – Kimberly Scardino, Deputy, Deputy Chief of the Telecommunications Access Policy Division in our Wireline Competition Bureau. I'm really lucky to have Kim here today uh, she, uh, to speak about um, the Lifeline reforms. Lifeline is uh, part of the Universal uh, Service Program, and uh, Kim is the uh, Commission's foremost expert in uh, Lifeline, in the Lifeline piece of that. And uh, she'll touch on, she'll go into a little bit about uh, how Lifeline relates to digital literacy as well, and that'll sort of pick up on what Josh was saying. Oh, Kim, let me help you get. Oh, give us one second here, sorry. Okay. Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm Kim Scardino, Deputy Division Chief of the um, Telecommunications Access Policy Division, and um, I oversaw the Lifeline Reform Order process, um, and I thought I would start by giving an overview of what the Lifeline program is. I'm sure many of you on the phone are intimately familiar with it. We've worked very closely with the states in particular on Lifeline Reform, but the Lifeline program is part of the Universal Service Fund, and it provides discounts to eligible telecommunic—excuse me—eligible qualifying low-income consumers on their voice uh, telephony service. The monthly discounts um, are provided through the carriers, who are called eligible telecommunications carriers, and the discount is an average of about 9.25. 925 uh, for non-tribal lands and um, an additional $25 on tribal lands. Um, as I mentioned, the support is, goes directly to the carriers, um, and they're called eligible telecommunications carriers, and it, um, they include both wireline and wireless providers. Um, and the Universal Service Administrative Company, or USAC, distributes the funds to the ETCs on a monthly or quarterly basis. After a year-long uh, process, on January 31st, the um, Commission adopted the Lifeline Reform Order and a further notice of proposed rulemaking, which we released on February 6th, um, and it comprehensively reforms and begins to modernize the program. Many of the rules that we adopted in the um, Lifeline Order 
um, are actually now effective. In fact, as of yesterday, we issued a public notice um, detailing the effective dates of some of the rules that had OMB that needed OMB approval. Um, so most of the rules that we adopted are effective already. Some of the rules take effect in on June 1st. But just to run through some of the highlights of the Lifeline um, reform order, um, prior to adopting the order, eligibility for Lifeline varied um, by state. So one thing that the um, order did was to develop uh, uniform eligibility guidelines so that in any state someone can qualify based on income, which is at 135 percent of the federal poverty guidelines, or by participating in one of the eight federal assistance programs that the um, FCC has, has um, adopted in rules. Um, those are some of those include Medicaid, food stamps, free school lunch. The three largest programs by which people qualify for Lifeline today are Medicaid, SSI, and food stamps. The order also um, adopted a one per household rule, meaning that the lifeline support is limited to um, one benefit per household, which is defined as an economic unit. Um, and an economic unit consists of all adult individuals contributing to or sharing in the income and expenses of a household. And that rule actually takes effect on June 1st. So starting in June, um, when um, people are signed up for Lifeline, there are rules um, that they must um, certify that they are the only one in their household who is um, receiving the Lifeline benefit. There are um, enhanced initial enrollment and annual certification procedures adopted in the order. I won't go into detail, but basically the way people sign up for Lifeline, um, we saw that the, the way that the program was in the past, which was largely self-certification, um, people didn't necessarily know what they were signing up for. So the enhanced rules that carriers need to adhere to um, are designed to protect the consumer so that the consumer understands what they're signing up for. But it also um, it benefits the carrier, too, because it will save um, them on costs down the road if, if everybody understands up front what the rules are. We also um, took significant steps in the order to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse in the program, including eliminating link-up, which was support provided for the initial installation of the service. Um, so now link up support is just available on tribal lands for those carriers that are receiving high cost support. Um, we also, the order also establishes a, the National Lifeline Accountability Database, which will be a national database where all Lifeline subscribers, right now there's 14 million Lifeline subscribers, will be in the database. And the purpose of it will be, it will be used to prevent um, duplicate uh, support going to households. Um, we have, in the last year, done um, some mini audits with USAC to uncover duplicative support and at last year looked at 12 states and um, just by eliminating duplicates in those 12 states, um, we'll save $35 million and we anticipate uh, doing more of those audits um, we, that they're called in-depth data validations or IDVs. Uh, this year while the database is um, being constructed. And this will be a competitive bidding process. There will be an RFP that USAC will release and um, will be put out there for um, database vendors to, um, to submit proposals and then um, the database will, we um, anticipate, will be up next year. The order also um, establishes a savings target for 2012 of $200 million, which um, will come from different um, measures that were implemented to eliminate waste, fraud, and abuse. And where I want to spend most of my time um, today is just talking about the, the broadband, um, because I think the states can, and uh, local um, authorities can play a big role in this. We, um, in the order, established, established a broadband goal um, for the program 
as well as allowed consumers, if to the extent that the carriers uh, permit it, to apply their discount to bundled offerings would be voice and, and data offerings. And then we also, um, the commission also adopted a broadband pilot, which we launched just this week. So on Monday, the Wireline Competition Bureau, which is the bureau that I work in, issued a public notice launching the um, broadband pilot program. Applications for the pilot program are due on July 2nd. Um, we anticipate um, selecting the um, applicants or selecting um, pilot participants um, in third quarter of this year. And on May 14th, we'll have a webinar um, at where people can come in person or also on the online hear about uh, it's, it's an opportunity for folks to ask questions about um, how the pilot project will run as well as hear some hear from some experts um, in field um, experimental design who can um, present some ideas on how to structure um, good projects. So just an overview of the pilot, it, um, the commission allocated $25 million um, from the Lifeline uh, Fund, which is derived from savings that I mentioned previously. And the purpose of the pilot is to test the necessary amount of support and the length of support. Those are two things that um, we can test in this pilot as part of the program. It's an 18-month pilot. Um, approximately three months to implement back office functions and 12 months of subsidized broadband service. And as you can see in the PN uh, that we issued, it, we talk about how we expect all subscribers to be enrolled within nine months of the, um, the uh, applicant um, starting to offer the service. So the support, similar to Lifeline, will go directly to the carriers um, for either standalone or bundled broadband service. And uh, we intend to give preference to ETCs who partner with third parties um, that have existing um, adoption programs in place or, or putting, putting uh, adoption programs in place as part of the pilot. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the webinar on May, May 14th. Uh, there's some detail about the speed offerings and um, how we expect um, applicants to attempt to address other uh, broadband adoption issues such as the cost of the device and digital literacy, which I know Josh spoke to you about. And then there's a data collection element to it. Um, attached to the public notice, we list a series of questions um, that we expect that um, whoever participates in the pilot will ask of consumers um, some que that those questions are designed um, for us to get good data on um, broadband adoption and you the way it will work is USAC um, the administrator will actually take in all the information and synthesize it but the raw data will actually be available to researchers um, after the pilot is available and then um, we expect to select a small number of projects. We don't have a number um, in place. Um, and um, as far as the partnerships go, the, like I said, the support has to go directly to the carriers. But the carriers certainly could partner with other groups, such as um, local governments, um, anyone that has a, has a um, project in place to um, support broadband adoption. Um, we're looking for innovative uh, solutions to this. Um, also attached to the Lifeline order was a further notice seeking comment on a host of issues. Um, you can see them on the slide, but they ranged from the eligibility database to um, requirements going forward for, for the carriers to participate in the program. Um, one of the um, elements of the further notice is um, on digital literacy, which I know Josh spoke to you about. Comments, um, we just got reply comments in yesterday, but to the extent anyone on the phone is interested in any of these issues and didn't get an opportunity to weigh in in comments, you certainly uh, can file an ex parte um, in the docket, which I put that information on the last slide. 
um, or contact us if you'd like to have a meeting or a conference call. I know that um, everyone's it doesn't it's not necessarily that you come in. We can certainly accommodate um, a phone um, conference if that's more convenient for you. So that's all I had, but stay tuned for more updates in the lifeline reform. Uh, Kim, thanks so much. Um, I, the uh, public notice about the, uh, the broadband, the uh, pilot program is up on the FCC. It's on the events page. So if you click through to the webinar, then the public notice that Kim spoke about with the pilot program and the money, which I know is of interest to our state and local governments, is up there. And um, like Kim said, uh, the third parties, ETCs can, can partner with third par parties who can be governments. So I'd really encourage everybody to take a look at that public notice. Uh, get by, get back to Kim. Get back to myself with questions. We'll figure out, um, you know, uh, uh, how to answer them and and work with you, because we think that's really that's really um, broadband's uh, the primary focus of this agency right now. I think it's fair to say. Okay. Th uh, does any you know? Let, let's ask uh, Kim to hang out for a minute or two to see if anybody emails or tweets a question. Or again, the uh, WebEx is up and running, so please uh, register via WebEx. Uh, do we have anything? We'll just we'll give it a minute. This is really this is really an opportunity for a lot of folks out there, and also if you're uh, if you're if you're uh, uh, watching from an AG's office and you work on communications, but it's not your primary topic, you know, please go ahead and send us a question. There's really, uh, you, you know, we just ask that you kind of keep it within the parameters of the uh, speakers and topics, but. Um, you know, there's no wrong or right. Uh, we know a lot of you are telecom experts, but uh, a lot of folks out there are not have uh, a lot of other things um, that they're taking care of as well. And I should I should note that we actually are um, providing um, materials about the new Lifeline rules that we intend to distribute to um, to all the folks on the phone. Um, that just give a give highlights of what the new rules require, and these some of these can be pamphlets that you could pass out um, at your different agencies. Okay, uh, well I guess uh, you've got you've had uh, your chance. Uh, again, uh, if you want to email anything in um, as a follow up, please go ahead and do so. And Kim, thanks so much again for your time. Thanks uh, for we having We really me. appreciate it. Thank you. Great. Next up, um, we're very lucky to have uh, David Firth. He is the Acting Bureau Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. So that means David is extremely busy, busier than he usually is as deputy. Uh, David is always very generous with his time to talk to uh, the state and local governments, whether it's at these webinars, which uh, David has been doing at, since the inception, or uh, speaking with our Intergovernmental Advisory Committee, or speaking uh, directly to the uh, uh, first responders and uh, public safety folks uh, uh, within his role in the Public Safety Bureau. David's going to speak about uh, Next Generation 911 public safety provisions of the payroll tax extension law, uh, create, uh, creation of the new public, new public safety network, and uh, commercial mobile alert systems, as well as the narrow banding? Actually, next generation 911 and uh, narrow banding. I the same may talk, if I have time, I can talk a little bit about the commercial alert, okay. alert systems as well. Let me, uh, let me make sure your um, presentation okay. is up and running. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. All righty. And uh, do I need to put it on slideshow, or will that uh, will they take care of that? They'll, they'll take care. Um, either way. Well, let's see if that works. Okay. All righty. Uh, well, ho hello to everyone uh, in uh, uh, out, out there in, in uh, on the internet and. Uh, Delighted to be here today uh, to talk about a number of uh, issues relating to public safety. Uh, there have been a number of very dramatic developments, um, particularly coming out of Congress uh, in the last few months. 
um, that relate to public safety uh, communications. And so I'm going to focus on those. I'll talk a little bit as well about some of the other um, issues that we are dealing with in the Public Safety Bureau. Um, but let's just dive right in. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, three specific topics, the Public Safety Broadband Network, uh, Next Generation 911, uh, narrow banding, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit at the end, if time permits, about other, other public safety issues that we are, are dealing with. Um, let me start by talking about the public safety broadband network. As, as many of you are, are undoubtedly aware, uh, the, the vision of a nationwide uh, interoperable public safety broadband network in the 700 megahertz spectrum has been uh, something that we and many others around the country have been pursuing for quite some time. Uh, as you're probably aware, the 700 megahertz band uh, is spectrum uh, that was was reclaimed by the FCC as a result of the DTV transition in 2009. And in fact, many of the efforts that we began uh, to look for new uses of uh, that spectrum began even before the DTV transition was completed. Um, so uh, there has for uh, some time uh, been uh, an allocation within the 700 megahertz band that was specifically dedicated for public safety use. In fact, it was Congress that specified uh, in legislation that uh, in the upper 700 megahertz band there would be spectrum that would be allocated for commercial uses uh, and then that there would be spectrum that would be allocated for public safety uses. Um, and uh, in the uh, original plan, uh, there was also a, a commercial block that was known as the 700 megahertz D block, um, which uh, the commission several years back uh, sought to match with the public safety broadband spectrum uh, to create a public-private partnership that would deploy a public safety broadband network. Uh, but unfortunately, the auction of the D block was not successful, and so that put the, the question of how should the D block be, uh, uh, be used um, back into play, and that is a question that uh, after lengthy debate, uh, Congress has answered. And so as part of the uh, payroll tax bill, the, the, the legislation that Congress passed uh, in February, um, there was a, a sweeping set of new statutory provisions relating to the public safety broadband network uh, that really have, have answered a lot of the questions that had held the process up for a long time and that have given all of us a path forward for realizing the vision of that broadband network. Um, so let me just start by highlighting uh, some of the, the major provisions in the legislation uh, that relate to the public safety broadband network. The, the first question that the statute answered was with respect to uh, the uh, status of the D block. And the statute mandates that the D block uh, is to be reallocated uh, from commercial use to public safety. And that was something that, that, that Congress had to do. We did not have the authority to do that reallocation. Uh, so Congress actually made the decision to reallocate the D block to public safety. Um, and to combine the D block with the spectrum that was already allocated for public safety broadband use that's immediately adjacent. And I'll, I'll have in a second a, a spectrum chart of the 700 megahertz band that will, that will lay this out a little bit more clearly. Um, the legislation also um, established the, um, the, the, the licensing and deployment regime for uh, deployment of the network. It created a new entity um, that is known as the First Responder Network Authority, what we uh, typically call FirstNet. Uh, FirstNet is a new entity that is going to be uh, stood up within NTIA. Uh, it does not yet exist, and in fact, there are provisions that uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit um, that uh, dictate uh, the structure of FirstNet and uh, the timing of its formation. Um, but uh, when once it is formed, FirstNet will hold the public safety broadband license, and that will be a license that will uh, um, cover both the existing public safety broadband spectrum and the D-block in one combined block. Uh, and FirstNet uh, will be responsible under the statute for the deployment and operation of the public safety broadband network. Um, 
And uh, the statute is very specific about um, who is to be on the first net board of directors. Uh, it includes federal, state, and local representation. Um, the federal representation is actually specified. Uh, there are, are several, um, uh, the, the, I believe it's the Secretary of Homeland Security, the Secretary of Commerce, uh, and um, uh, one or two others that are, are, are specified as federal uh, members of the board. Uh, and then there are also NTIAs to pick uh, state and local representatives uh, for the board as well. And they must appoint those local members, state and local members, by August 20th, 2012. Uh, and uh, that, again, is a statutory requirement. Um, the legislation also provided, and this is a v very important, uh, up to $7.3 billion in funding for the network um, and that funding is going to be raised through future FCC incentive auctions. Uh, and in a separate provision in the statute, which I won't be discussing uh, in this presentation, but which, uh, which is obviously very important, um, there is a statutory uh, uh, mandate uh, and provision for those incentive auctions. Um, and those will be uh, auctions of additional spectrum uh, in the current broadcast band uh, and the revenue that is, is raised by um, those auctions uh, is specifically authorized to be used um, up to $7.3 billion uh, for funding of this network. Um, that $7.3 billion will be administered by NTIA through a grant program, um, and they also are authorized to borrow $2 billion of that money up front um, to help to uh, stand up the, uh, the network in the first place. Um, and that's important because those incentive auctions probably will not occur for a couple of years. So having that upfront borrowing authority is important. Um, there is also a provision in the statute uh, that allows states uh, to opt out and deploy uh, state uh, radio networks uh, if they choose to. Now, they, they can only do so if they meet certain requirements. Um, number one, they still have to use the, the network core that is, uh, uh, is going to be developed by, by FirstNet. Um, and they also have to demonstrate um, and, and demonstrate to the FCC uh, that even though they're opting out of the national network, their deployed state network will be fully interoperable with uh, the national network so that there will not be uh, any compromise on the vision of the national network being entirely interoperable. So there is a, a process that's laid out in the statute. Um, after uh, NTIA and FirstNet puts out its uh, uh, request for proposal and ultimately uh, uh, publishes its blueprint for the nationwide network, that's the point at which states can opt out. Uh, and uh, if the FCC approves, they can do their own deployment subject to those restrictions. Um, this is the uh, band plan that uh, I was referring to previously. This just illustrates uh, how the uh, 700 megahertz band uh, is, is now going to be uh, divvied up between uh, commercial use and public safety use. Um, what you have here is um, uh, all of the spectrum uh, between what was originally television channel 52 and television channel 69. Um, those are indicated in the kind of uh, orange bars. Uh, and then that spectrum has been repurposed. Uh, the blue spectrum has been repurposed for commercial, commercial use, and most of that has been auctioned. And we've indicated uh, in the, the blocks um, who the principal licensees are uh, for the, uh, the commercial spectrum. Um, and then the public safety spectrum is divided into two segments. Um, the PSBB stands for Public Safety Broadband. The PSNB stands for Public Safety Narrowband. And uh, so, and there are, are paired spectrum for, for base and mobile transmits, which is why you see two PSBB blocks and two PSNB blocks. Um, so uh, the Public Safety Narrowband spectrum is spectrum that is, is dedicated for traditional public safety narrowband use, uh, which is, is typically uh, mission-critical voice. Uh, and then the public safety broadband spectrum, this now includes the former D block and the spectrum that was previously um, allocated by the FCC for public safety broadband use. So that is now a, a 20 megahertz block, a 10 by 10 megahertz block um, that can be used for public safety broadband. Um, and as indicated, FirstNet, uh, when it is stood up, uh, will be awarded the license for that spectrum by the FCC. And again, that's, that is a, a statutory requirement. Um, 
So FirstNet um, will, will operate within an environment in which uh, there are also uh, commercial broadband deployments, uh, and in fact the statute specifies um, that the public safety broadband network has to be built using uh, uh, LTE uh, as, as the technical standard, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, technical elements that will go into the network. Um, and that uh, LTE requirement is consistent with the commercial deployments uh, in the band, which have also been all of, all of which have been LTE. So um, how is this transition uh, going, to, uh, going to take place? Well, uh, again, the statute is actually quite specific um, about the transmission mechanism for uh, basically handing off responsibility for the public safety broadband uh, spectrum and network to FirstNet. There, there is a general requirement in the statute that the FCC facilitate the transition of the public safety broadband spectrum to FirstNet. Um, one element of that is uh, that the statute required that the FCC create um, a technical advisory board uh, for first responder interoperability, what we call the interoperability board. Um, the uh, purpose uh, of that board um, was uh, specified in the statute. Uh, it, its purpose is to develop, to develop recommended technical requirements to ensure that the public safety broadband network um, will support nationwide interoperability based on the LTE standard. Um, the board recommendations um, are submitted to the FCC for review. Uh, and then the FCC um, approves those recommendations with any revisions it deems necessary and transmits them to FirstNet. So that's the process that the statute laid out for the work of the board and the work of the FCC with respect to this key interoperability component. Uh, and, and, and this is extremely important because um, in order to realize the vision of a nationwide interoperable network, we need to make sure that, that as we launch that network, as we take those first steps to, towards deployment of the network, um, we support interoperability from the beginning um, because that it really needs to be part of the DNA of the network from the beginning. Um, the statute gave us a very tight set of deadlines um, for convening the board, for the board to do its work, and for the FCC to transmit the recommendations. The, the first requirement uh, was to appoint the interoperability board members. Uh, the statute gave us uh, 30 days from the time it was enacted to uh, do that. Uh, so as of March 23rd, the FCC uh, met that obligation and did appoint the interoperability board. That board is now uh, hard at work uh, because it is required um, by May 22nd, so only a few weeks from now, to submit its recommendations to the FCC. Um, they, uh, the, the board consists of a, a broad spectrum of, of technical experts. Uh, some come from the public safety community, some come from commercial carriers, some come from the vendor community. Um, and uh, it was selected with technical expertise in mind. Uh, and again, there were certain uh, breadth requirements that the statute required us to meet in standing up the board. But it is, is highly qualified to look at these technical issues. Um, and it has been working literally day and night uh, to, to come up with recommendations. Uh, they held a workshop a couple of weeks ago. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, on May 22nd, they will be transmitting their recommendations to the FCC. And then the FCC, at the point when those recommendations are submitted, has 30 days to uh, review them, um, to make any revisions that the commission deems necessary, and then to transmit those recommendations to FirstNet. Um, and the recommendations are important because the statute requires that those recommendations then be incorporated into FirstNet's uh, request for proposal that it's going to use as the uh, pri primary document uh, to solicit bids uh, for uh, the development of the network. Um, so these recommendations are, are extremely important under the, the, the statutory scheme. Um, let me now turn to a couple of other provisions that are in the, uh, in, in the um, same Spectrum Act uh, that was passed in February uh, relating to Next Generation 911. Um, Next Generation 911, uh, as you may know, is, is a, a kind of catch-all term for the migration of our existing 911 system uh, to an Internet-based platform. 
um, that will not only sustain uh, and support the existing system, the traditional telephone-based system, but that will also uh, enable uh, consumers to use uh, new devices, new means of communication over uh, an IP network to communicate with 911 call centers. Um, and this is something that uh, next generation 911 is something that has been uh, uh, worked on by many people in the 911 community and the vendor community for the course of the last 10 years to come up with a blueprint for its design uh, and to look for for strategies to actually deploy next generation 911, which is going to be an enormous task. Um, that uh, is 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 something that the commission has ongoing rulemaking proceedings to deal with, uh, and and that many others are are looking at as well. What what the the uh, statute did um, kind of overlaid on this ongoing next generation 911 effort was 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 several important things. Um, number one, um, one of the uh, issues that that uh, affects next generation 911 uh, is the issue of of liability protection. Um, this is ensuring that uh, the providers of 911 service, whether you're talking about uh, public safety providers or the, the uh, commercial carriers and commercial providers that support 911 service, um, will um, be appropriately protected from liability for the provision of that service. And uh, there was a statute that was passed several years ago called the Net 911 Act. Um, which extended existing state liability protection, uh, whatever liability protection that it had been extended by states to uh, legacy 911 providers. Uh, the Net 911 Act uh, extended it to uh, certain forms of, of, of new technology, such as interconnected VoIP. Um, that was a very important step, and what this legislation has done is to take an additional step um, in the same direction, which is to extend that sa those same liability protection provisions to next generation 911. Um, so what this statute now says is that whatever liability protection a state uh, has chosen to provide to its legacy 911 providers must also be extended to next generation 911 providers. Um, and that is is a, a kind of umbrella protection that, that is very important to create um, the right climate, the right incentives for the development of, of next generation 911 uh, throughout the country. Um, then in addition to uh, uh, taking that step, um, the statute also uh, reestablished the uh, 911 Implementation and Coordination Office, which we refer to as ICO. Uh, this, as you may know, was an office that was established uh, uh, in years past um, under the uh, aegis of the National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration and NTIA. Um, and existed for a number of years to help to coordinate uh, initially uh, the, the deployment of phase two uh, and then other enhancements to the 911 system. Um, but uh, its uh, authorization uh, expired uh, several years ago. Uh, and so what this uh, legislation does is it, is it reestablishes uh, ICO uh, and allows it to be stood up once again, uh, this time with, with more of a focus on next generation 911. And so we, we uh, plan to collaborate closely um, with ICO uh, in its reconstituted form on a number of our 911 initiatives. Uh, and uh, this will also be very important for state and local government efforts to uh, both support uh, the legacy 911 system and to support migration to next generation. Um, several other uh, provisions in the statute that relate to next generation 911. Um, one is a provision um, that uh, requires actually uh, two reports to Congress um, uh, within a year of the enactment of the statute. So these reports are due to Congress next February, February of 2013. Um, one of these reports uh, is uh, to uh, focus on next generation 911 costs. And in fact, that, w that report, the lead agency for that will be the reconstituted ICO. Uh, they will work in coordination with the FCC and with DHS and with others uh, to prepare that report. Um, the other report, which the FCC will have the lead on, will be recommendations uh, for a legal and regulatory framework to further next generation 911 deployment. And both of these reports actually come from recommendations that the FCC made in the National Broadband Plan. 
um, back in uh, uh, back a couple of years ago, um, where in our discussion of next generation 911, we recommended both a cost, a, a comprehensive cost study, uh, and a further um, uh, examination of a legal regulatory frame, framework uh, to further next generation 911 uh, across the country. Um, so we will have the lead on the legal and regulatory framework report. We will also be coordinating with the other offices. Uh, we expect that uh, in uh, the, the next uh, few months we will be putting out a, a public notice in which we will be soliciting ideas and, and comment um, on what uh, recommendations should go into that report. Um, so we are, we are very interested in input from uh, uh, state and local authorities uh, that are, are really the kind of boots on the ground in terms of deploying next generation 911 about what the appropriate framework should be. Uh, Sorry, sorry, David. I was just going to uh, uh, jump in in the uh, state and local use of 911 fees. I would say it's uh, uh, pretty pretty important in, in how it, um, the next generation 911 is going to going to be uh, implemented. And yes, then, yes, and about the fees. Go ahead. Are the fees uh, going into uh, a general fund and not being used for uh, state and local? Well, there, there actually are some separate pieces of the legislation that deal with that, and in fact, the bottom bullet, as you'll see, deals with fees, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But I, but I do think that that uh, we, we haven't been given any any restrictions in terms of what recommendations to make uh, as far as that legal and regulatory framework is concerned. Um, so certainly, um, fee issues could be uh, could be considered uh, within within that report. Um, and I'll come back to the fee uh, the fee issue at the end. Um, another uh, provision that Congress uh, added was um, a um, grant funding provision for 911 and next generation 911. Um, now, I, I, I think because their their focus was on the public safety broadband network and the 7.3 billion dollars that that uh, was allocated for that, um, the amount of of uh, money that was uh, uh, set aside for 911 next generation 911 purposes was was much smaller. Um, that's it's 150 million dollars, which which uh, is is obviously uh, significant, um, but uh, is is probably only a a, a portion of what's going to be required for full next generation 911 deployment. Uh, but still, it's a it's a significant commitment. The other caveat I would I would offer um, is that the the funding uh, the funding of that 115 million, which also comes from FCC incentive auctions, is contingent on first of all um, raising the 7.3 billion dollars to fund the public safety network, and also uh, funding uh, 20 billion dollars towards deficit reduction. So the incentive auction has to uh, yield uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 27, 28 billion, uh, billion dollars. Uh, before the grant funding for next generation 911 would become available. Of course, it is our hope, um, and we will do everything in our power to make the incentive auction wildly successful um, so that those, uh, those um, funding and deficit targets will be met and that funding will be available. But uh, I think what this also underscores is that the issue of, of uh, funding for next generation 911 will not be fully resolved by this legislation, even if the $115 million is forthcoming. Uh, the last thing that the legislation did um, with respect to 911 um, is it, it commissioned GAO to report to Congress on the state and local use of 911 fees. Um, now, this is on top of, of existing efforts that, that the FCC has been undertaking for the last several years under the Net 911 Act to provide annual reports on the state and local use of 911 fees. Uh, we've issued three annual reports. Uh, and we will be soon going out with our information collection to uh, collect information for the fourth annual report. So uh, that work will continue. It's not affected by this statute, but uh, we will also be coordinating with GAO uh, as they do their uh, mandated report to Congress. Uh, this is just uh, this next slide is just a summary of our, our existing next generation 911 proceedings. Um, that uh, preceded the statute. Uh, we have two uh, major rulemakings that uh, are underway. Um, one was a notice of proposed rulemaking that was adopted in uh, September uh, on enabling text to 911 and uh, other multimedia applications in the 911 system. Um, we looked at a number of issues, including the feasibility of uh, implementing uh, text to 911. Um, on an interim basis in the near term, 
even before next generation 911 is, is fully deployed. Uh, we also sought comment on a variety of long-term alternatives for facilitating IP-based delivery of real-time text, of photos, of videos, and other data to uh, PSAPs as they become next generation capable. Uh, there's a major focus in this proceeding on enhancing 911 access for people with disabilities. Um, which uh, is the subject of a separate statutory mandate under uh, 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 legislation that was passed by Congress in 2010, uh, but that's also part of this proceeding. And, and we also have, have sought comment on the very important issue of, of consumer education to make sure that as next generation 911 and these new capabilities are, are deployed, um, that consumers uh, are, are well informed about uh, what is available um, so that we don't have uh, a mismatch between the capabilities of the system and, and public expectations. We also have a separate proceeding that's looking at the issue of location accuracy for next generation 911. Uh, location accuracy uh, will be just as important for next generation uh, 911. Uh, applications as it is for the legacy system. Um, there are technical issues that have to be uh, addressed in the next generation context, but the goal is the same, which is to ensure that, that as next generation 911 is deployed, it uh, has the built-in capability to provide location information to uh, 911 call takers so that uh, those who are, are using the system can be located quickly. Got a few minutes left, so I just want to touch on a couple of other things. Um, VHF, UHF narrowbanding, this is an issue on which we've uh, done a lot of outreach um, to the public safety community, to state and local uh, agencies. Um, this is a mandate that has been in place for, for some time. Uh, the the, the narrowbanding program was actually something that the commission initiated almost 20 years ago. Uh, and the deadline uh, that is rapidly approaching is a deadline that we set back in 2004. Uh, but uh, we, we, with increasing sort of uh, bold print and uh, exclamation points, we are, are continuing to remind uh, those with VHF, UHF licenses that that deadline is January 1st, 2013. Um, and uh, by that deadline, uh, VHF and UHF land mobile licensees have to migrate their systems from 25 kilohertz to 12 and a half kilohertz channel bandwidth. Many, many licensees have already done that. Uh, it has important benefits uh, in terms of relieving spectrum congestion uh, and uh, providing increased channel capacity. Um, it's also important that uh, we get as many licensees uh, as possible narrow-banded by the deadline because uh, the longer that we have uh, licensees who are out of compliance, the more there is, is a risk of harmful interference. Uh, and uh, for licensees that, that uh, ignore the rules, there is the potential for FCC enforcement action. Now, we have recognized that there are licensees that have uh, uh, unique uh, and compelling circumstances that may require them um, to seek a waiver uh, to ob obtain more time, relief, some relief from the deadline. Uh, and we've put out a series of public notices um, to assist licensees who uh, may need additional time on what we are looking for in waiver requests. Uh, and in particular, uh, we're looking for well-documented requests um, and our public notices specify the type of information that we are, are looking for uh, in a well-documented request. Um, and we're also uh, asking that licensees uh, seek only as much time as, as they need to achieve compliance by a date certain. Uh, and therefore, uh, it's, it's important that the waiver request be accompanied by uh, a schedule with milestones so that, that uh, we can verify that uh, licensees are, are only seeking the amount of time that they need uh, and we can uh, make sure that they are keeping up with the milestones as they move forward. There are a number of other issues that we're working on. Um, I've just put a few of them on this slide, uh, and uh, any one of them could uh, uh, probably merit another, another presentation in another, another webinar. Um, outage reporting, uh, this is the requirements um, that we um, uh, have for telecommunications carriers when they have major outages in their system, whatever the cause. Uh, they are required to report those uh, outages to the FCC. Uh, and we use that data to help analyze vulnerabilities in networks and often to work with the carriers on how to make their networks more resilient. Uh, earlier this spring, uh, we extended those reporting requirements uh, to voice over Internet protocol providers. Uh, so this is, is important as, as uh, American consumers 
increasingly are using VoIP as an alternative to traditional landline service. Uh, it's important that, that our uh, resiliency and outage reporting regime uh, extend to that to ensure that those networks also are reliable. Uh, we've also been doing a lot in the cybersecurity field. Um, uh, just uh, uh, about a month ago, um, we issued uh, a number of recommendations um, for voluntary measures that the Internet community could use to uh, combat cyber threats to communications networks. Um, and we're also looking um, at, at wireless service interruptions. And we've, uh, in fact, I think are just now receiving comments on a public notice that we issued on um, legal and policy issues that may be raised uh, where uh, state or local government uh, uh, needs to interrupt wireless service temporarily for public safety purposes. Um, and so that's an extremely important issue, um, both from a, a public safety point of view, but also from a just more general legal and policy point of view. So I think that my, my time is up, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to uh, – provide you with information. If you have additional questions and we don't have a chance to address them in the webinar, I've, I've put my contact information uh, on the slide. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to contact uh, me directly or to work through um, our, our uh, CGB representatives. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any further questions that people may have. Great. Uh, thanks, David. I know uh, uh, th there was a lot of material for everybody to take in, so the, the David's PowerPoint will be up on the uh, events page for this webinar, and you could uh, look at that um, at your leisure. Also, we do, we do have a, a, a question. It's from um, uh, Jerry Letterer over at Best Best and Krieger, who works with a, a lot of state and local governments. I could, I'll, let me read into the mic. I have a copy. Um, it's uh, fair, fairly technical. So he's, Dave, uh, Jerry says, David, HR 3630 requires public safety licensees vacate the T-band spectrum by 2021. The FCC had, it has issued a public notice detailing the, suspens the suspension of future applications for minor and major expansions of existing T-band systems. We further assume the FCC will deny any future applications for modifications of ex existing T-band systems, and the FCC will have will have to auction T-band spectrum within nine years. However, HR 3630 does not identify replacement spectrum for existing public safety licensees currently utilizing this spectrum due to the lack of available spectrum in certain geographic areas. The loss of this spectrum poses a significant threat to some local governments' existing public safety infrastructure. What guidance would the FCC offer such communities with requesting uh, with request to acquiring alternate spectrum to accommodate existing operations and to facilitate future growth, and where can we find the funds to do so? Would the commission make itself available to assist communities facing this type of challenge? Okay, uh, Jerry, that is way beyond my expertise. <laughs> I am now. I used to be an attorney in the Wireless Bureau. I used to be a mile deep, uh, inch wide. Now I'm. Uh, they go uh, inch, inch deep, mile wide. So uh, thank goodness David is sitting next to me and can uh, help on this. Well, That's I, what he's here for. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, this, this provision of the legislation. Uh, I, I didn't include it in my summary in part because, as, as, as was indicated, it is a fairly technical provision um, that, that uh, it take, would, would take some time to kind of walk through. Um, you've asked a lot of great questions, and, and I, I think that the, the, the short answer is we're, we're really at the beginning of the process. Of, of looking at, at uh, what uh, the implications are of the statutory provision uh, and um, how how to implement it. Uh, and um, so the only steps that we've taken at this point are, are short-term steps. You've alluded to one of them um, to basically stabilize the spectrum landscape in the T-band. We, uh, uh, we issued a public notice to suspend uh, filing of future applications. Uh, actually, there are certain types of minor applications that we will still allow, but but expansions uh, of uh, existing systems that would expand their channel usage or their geographic footprint. Uh, we have suspended those. Uh, the other uh, step that we took um, was we uh, we also waived the narrow banding requirement that I was just talking about specifically with respect to uh, systems in the T band, but only limited to those systems. Um, so um, to the extent that there are T band systems that were subject to the narrow banding deadline, we've waived that deadline. But anyone who's not in the T band is still very much subject to the deadline. Um, so we've taken those short term steps, but I think in terms of the long term questions that you ask, uh, they're great questions. We don't have answers for them at this point. 
Um, but we very much want to hear from T-band licensees on this. And uh, we've already heard from some. Uh, and uh, I think that we want to initiate a dialogue to, first of all, understand the impact that this, this legislation has uh, on T-band licensees uh, and to explore what options uh, may be possible under the statute. Um, so um, I, I wish I had more to tell you at this point. We, we don't have any magic solutions at this point. It, I think, creates a number of difficult challenges. But uh, certainly we are, are very interested in hearing uh, from the licensees that are directly affected by this provision um, so that we can get a better understanding of, of their situation and what options might or might not be available. Thanks, uh, David and uh, Jerry, for the uh, question. Um, well, I, I, I haven't seen anything else uh, come in, so uh, we don't want to eat up uh, too much more of David's time. Uh, to the extent you have any, you think of any questions, please feel free to email them to live questions, or you could uh, uh, myself, Gregory at FCC.gov, and we'll get them over to the Public Safety Bureau. And David, thanks again. Um, uh, David is. He's one of the most knowledgeable people at the Commission on public safety issues, and he's always very generous with his time working with you um, states and localities who are also the uh, Public Safety Bureau's partners. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. You know, I think we, uh, I think we have a little break scheduled until um, 22, so we have like uh, five minutes of uh, downtime, and uh, we ask that you uh, – tune back in at uh, 2.40, and I also ask again that um, if, you, if you have not registered via WebEx to please go ahead and do so, so we can capture all your information. Thanks. Is, oh, yeah, it's on? Okay. Great. Welcome back to the rest of our state and local government webinar. We hope you are still tuned in. Again, I'm putting my plug to register via WebEx. We had some technical uh, difficulties at the start, but that will really help us uh, keep you on our um, distribution list of uh, items that are of interest to states and localities. Uh, next up, uh, we have Rebecca Hansen, uh, Senior Advisor on Broadcast Spectrum in the Media Bureau. Rebecca has done a number of presentations in the past. Um, uh, at commission events and uh, speaking outside of the commission on uh, incentive auctions. And today, uh, Rebecca is going to talk about how they relate to um, state-owned networks. I just want to take a minute and uh, uh, talk about the incentive auctions for a second. I know we have a lot of telecom experts um, watching, but for those of you who have uh, other areas that you're responsible for, or energy, whatever, your municipal attorney, you could be doing any any sort of things. Uh, the big deal with the incentive auctions is that it, Congress gives us, is, is giving the authority for um, current FCC broadcast spectrum licensees to auction the spectrum and receive money for that. Prior to that, any 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 money from any spectrum that was auctioned, the money would go into the general treasury. This is an, it's called an incentive auction because it's, um, it's an incentive to get broadcast, to get broadcasters off the spectrum, which they may not, they may not be using to its fullest value in some areas of the country. So they're incentivized by being able to get dollars to do this. And it was uh, fairly a big step because when the auction, when uh, uh, Congress gave FCC auction authority, I think in 1993, mm -hmm. from what I remember, um, that auction authority was uh, any spectrum that was auctioned, the money had to go into the general treasury. So we needed new um, legislation, new laws to do this, and, and that's and, and that's what this incentive auction business is all about. <laughs> okay, in a nutshell. <laughs> so that's. Uh, uh, that, that, that's the uh, Reader's Digest version. <laughs> okay, uh, without further ado, uh, we have Rebecca. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, and will this? Ah, there, there we go. We go. Um, yeah, as Greg said, I'm here to present an overview of the uh, concept of an incentive auction and how it relates to broadcast spectrum. 
Um, Greg did give a high-level overview of what an incentive auction is. Uh, the concept was really developed as part of the national broadband plan that the FCC produced uh, back in 2010. And during the course of that, of writing that plan and researching uh, broadband around that plan, uh, we learned that um, the use of wireless broadband is increasing so exponentially that eventually our concern is we will be running out of spectrum, sufficient spectrum to sustain the increasing data traffic that um, people are using through the increased uh, availability of smartphones, tablets, iPads, etc. We hear reports that you, compared to the uh, original feature phones, smartphones and tablets and iPads are using hundreds of times the data that original phones used. And our networks are still designed uh, for, those, for those original phones. They don't yet quite have the capacity to handle what we expect to be a deluge of traffic as more and more smartphones enter the marketplace and more and more tablets are being used and more and more high uh, volume data is being run over those devices. Um, at the same time, our research found that viewers of over-the-air television have been steadily shifting to cable and satellite so that now we average around 10% on a nationwide basis of viewers that watch television over the air and not through cable or satellite. Um, so that gave us the idea that to help with the spectrum crisis that we anticipate will hit in a couple of years, we needed a mechanism to make the television spectrum available for wireless broadband use. Um, and not th primarily because the television spectrum sits right next to the 700 uh, band spectrum, which was auct auctioned in 2008 for 4G wireless network rollouts. Um, so for that reason, we focused our uh, thinking on incentive auctions to on the TV bands. Um, not only because the spectrum itself is very conducive for wireless broadband, but also given the lack of over-the-air television or the decline in over-the-air television viewership and some of the struggles that television stations are going through financially, we thought that that market condition presented actually one of the more valuable opportunities for the television sector for us to focus on um, television spectrum being contributed for an exchange of auction proceeds. So, um, so that's how we came up with the concept of an incentive auction. Essentially, we needed a market-based mechanism to redirect spectrum to where it was needed most, which is for flexible use and uh, primarily wireless broadband. So what is an incentive auction exactly? It's uh, an auction of spectrum, but the spectrum is going to be contributed voluntarily by broadcasters. After it's contributed voluntarily, the FCC is going to configure that spectrum into larger contiguous blocks to create more value for all the stakeholders involved. Right now, television spectrum is allocated in six megahertz blocks, but we believe that in the future, wireless broadband uh, providers are going to need much larger blocks and in nationwide format, not just market by market formats, to deliver the kind of high throughput data that uh, these devices um, are needing as we go forward. And by configuring the spectrum into larger blocks, we're, cr we're creating more value not only for the wireless companies who license those blocks, but also for the contributing broadcasters who will share in a portion of those increased proceeds that we create by reconfiguring the band. So once we reconfigure these blocks, uh, we will auction them to wireless carriers. And then with the proceeds that we receive from those auctions, we will share those proceeds with whoever contributed their spectrum and, of course, the, uh, the treasury. Now, this concept of an incentive auction can be applied to a variety of spectrum bands, and we have the authority to apply it to a variety of spectrum bands, but the auction we're focusing on now um, is uh, with respect to the television bands. Um, and as Greg said, this is a very innovative approach for us. Up until February of this year, we did not have the authority to share proceeds with um, 
current licensees. The reason we needed that authority is because as wireless communications mature, most of the spectrum, especially the best spectrum for wireless communications is occupied. So the ability to incentivize volunteers to turn in their spectrum in exchange for auction proceeds is a very important spectrum management tool for us going, going forward. And that tool was granted to us by Congress in the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012, which was signed by the President in, on February 22nd. And if any of you listening heard my previous presentations on this, um, you, you'll find that the Job Creation Act is very consistent with the vision that we've been laying out uh, in our previous webinars about um, this incentive auction for broadcasters. The spectrum contributions will be voluntary. That's an essential part of what we're trying to do. And um, the statute includes the three options for contributing broadcasts that we have described in the past, which includes the option to, for a station to contribute all six megahertz of its license spectrum, to channel share, or to voluntarily move from the UHF to a VHF channel in exchange for proceeds. And I can uh, go into each of those options in more detail. Um, the, the first option is pretty straightforward. We are seeking to incentivize uh, uh, broadcasters who choose to do so to contribute their entire six megahertz of spectrum. How this would work is they would set a reserve price, which is essentially uh, the value that they put on that spectrum. That licensee would then turn in all its, its, its six megahertz license, and then essentially the, the station would go off the air. And that former licensee could then use those pro proceeds to um, either invest in other stations in that broadcaster's group, if the broadcaster owns a multi-station group, um, or the that broadcaster could invest proceeds in new content distribution or other businesses. In other words, whatever proceeds that contributor receives through the auction, they're free to do with um, wh whatever they like. The same is true for all three options, actually. The, sex, the second and third options um, we are very important to us because these options allow broadcasters to contribute spectrum to the auction to help alleviate our spectrum shortage. These options allow them to participate in proceed share and take a, um, a, a share of the proceeds as a cash infusion into their businesses. But most importantly, these two options allow them to also stay on the air. Uh, which is important for a variety of policy objectives. Um, in the channel sharing example, a broadcaster, again, would uh, determine a reserve price for sharing a 6 megahertz channel. Then that broadcaster would find another broadcaster in his or her market who was also interested in channel sharing. Um, each of those broadcasters would then occupy a 6 megahertz channel, um, but instead of what the situation would be today where there would be one licensee um, having multiple, carrying multiple streams of um, second tier multicast streams, in this situation the two channel sharing broadcasters would each be individually licensed from the FCC, which is very important because that means each of those channel sharing broadcasters would retain their must carry rights, which is essential for the health of their business. As I mentioned before, with a national average of around 90% of viewers viewing content through cable and satellite systems, without must carry rights, uh, it would be very difficult for an over the air broadcaster to sustain its business model without, you know, 90% of that advertising revenue coming from 90% of that audience. Um, and in this example, a, a station, you know, you ask, well, what kind of broadcaster would be interested in this option? And that would be a, any broadcaster who, whose main revenue source comes from their primary stream and they aren't in a position to program or otherwise monetize their multicast streams. So we believe that this channel sharing option allows them to retain their primary stream, continue to finance their business uh, through that primary stream, um, and while at the same time receiving a cash infusion from the proceeds that, uh, they, that this broadcaster received to the auction. 
The third option um, would allow a broadcaster to voluntarily, a broadcaster who's currently in the UHF band, to voluntarily move down to the VHF band, again, for a price that it sets uh, for itself. So this, in this case, a broadcaster would determine how much is it worth them to move from the UHF down to the VHF. Um, they would contribute their spectrum. If, if that spectrum was accepted, that broadcaster would receive a new 6 megahertz channel assignment in the VHF. It also would retain, um, it would retain its must carry rights. Nothing would change there. Unlike the channel sharing option, which is a reduction of capacity for a broadcaster, the move to VHF is not a reduction of capacity, um, but rather some would say it's a reduction uh, with res respect to the reach of that station because broadcasting digitally in the VHF is much more difficult than uh, broadcasting in the UHF as we understand it. Um, and so this is the trade-off that a contributing broadcaster choosing this option would price as it comes up with its um, reserve price. Now, the act I mentioned includes some very important protections for broadcasters, and those broadcasters fall into two groups. For the broadcasters that are participating in the auction, the law requires us to keep their contributions confidential. We believe that this is essential for the success of the auction because contributing spectrum to the auction is a strategic business decision for a station to make. And most strategic business decisions are better kept uh, confidential. So that's that's our intention there. And that's set forth clearly in the law. Um, and as I mentioned before, the preservation of must carry rights for stations broadcasting over less than a six megahertz channel in a channel sharing scenario, we think is a very important protection to make this, the channel sharing option attractive. Now, for broadcasters who choose not to participate in the auction, uh, the statute protects that group by mandating that we cannot make any broadcaster involuntarily move from the UHF to the VHF. Um, we also are required to use reasonable efforts to preserve the coverage area and the population served of broadcasters who are remaining in the band. And the statute also creates a $1.75 billion fund to reimburse those broadcasters who will continue to broadcast, uh, to reimburse them for their repacking costs. Because after we reconfigure the band in the larger wireless broadband blocks that I mentioned before, we will be shifting the remaining broadcasters um, into the remaining part of the broadcast band, and there will be some costs incurred there that uh, we will we'll reimburse through this fund. Now, a question we get a lot is, well, uh, broadcasters ask us, well, how do I know what my spectrum is worth, or how do I know what my station I is worth? Um, and so the question is, how will proceeds be shared? Some broadcasters are under the impression that they'll just get a fixed percentage, be it 10, 20, 30 percent of the auction proceeds attributable to their contribution. But that's not what we have in mind. Um, under the reverse auction part of the statute, which describes the contributions of spectrum that broadcasters will make, um, the process, while we're working through the precise auction rules right now and structure, conceptually, a voluntary, uh, a volunteering broadcaster would submit a reserve price along with the spectrum that he or she is contributing. In other words, that reserve price is the minimum price at which that broadcaster is willing to part with its spectrum or is willing to participate in any one of the three options that we laid out. We also believe that this setting their own reserve price is an essential part to the voluntary nature of this auction because we, uh, the FCC, we believe we have no business in valuing this spectrum. We believe that a broadcaster who is seeking to transfer its station to us essentially is in the best position to put a price on that transfer just as broadcasters do every day when they um, negotiate mergers and acquisitions. Um, 
So, you know, it, one of the most important takeaways we have uh, for broadcasters when we are educating them as to these opportunities is that the broadcasters set their reserve price and no broadcaster will be giving up spectrum for a price less than it sets for itself. And how, how would a broadcaster go about setting that price? Well, again, this is an area where the FCC does not, uh, you know, we don't feel that uh, it's, it's appropriate for us to have a role in this. Um, but we do believe that in what one appropriate possible starting point for formulating a reserve price would be the enterprise value of what your station is worth today. So if a station is going to transfer its, its station in an acquisition, that station, that owner comes up with a value for the station and puts a price on it. Um, in these new options, that calculation will be, you know, somewhat of first impression. Um, but there are all there is a number of factors you can put into an analysis of what it would take to get a company to channel share. How would you value giving up the capacity that channel sharing requires you to do? Um, similarly, on the third option, how would you value? Um, some of the broadcast compromises that you make you, moving from UHF to VHF. All of these options do require the broadcaster giving up something, um, but the reserve price is the incentive by which we are compensating broadcasters to give up those other opportunities. And there may be other considerations too, for example, uh, to the extent if a broadcaster is getting out of the business and they have shutdown costs or they have to take down their tower. Uh, these are the other factors that we think uh, would also go into a, res into a reserve price. Public television stations, uh, we believe, have some unique aspects um, to them that make, especially channel sharing in our view, a fairly attractive opportunity. Um, we've studied the sector. We understand there's a high concentration of public telev television stations in many markets. Um, we also know that many states are cutting their public television content budgets. And we believe that channel sharing could be an opportunity to rationalize the public television sector where there is a lot of redundancy in programming or where there are six stations in a market where there are. We believe that channel sharing would provide an opportunity for stations to come together, maintain their programming all on one channel, keep their must carry, but eliminate some of the uh, duplication in the marketplace and quite possibly um, increase um, efficiencies in programming and maybe stem off some of the dilutive effect that this, duplica this duplication has on uh, fundraising, for example. Um, similarly, moving to VHF could also be an appropriate choice for some public television stations. Um, and we're working to develop a number of viable ways for public broadcasters to receive the auction proceeds that they need, but to still fulfill their coverage mission. Um, and I think, you know, the main takeaway I have for this audience is um, to the extent there are state laws out there that put any sort of restriction on a state licensee, either a state-owned network or a, um, a station that might be indirectly owned by the state through a, a community college or what have you, I would encourage state legislatures to audit their laws to ensure that there aren't any obstacles to a station contributing because even though this is still a relatively new concept and even though um, states might not now have any intention and any intention to um, contribute their spectrum in the auction, if two, two and a half, three years from now um, this does become an attractive option we wouldn't want there to be any restrictions in the legislation that could take one or two legislative cycles to fix that would prevent that um, yeah. station from participating. Yeah. And, and, and that's right. So um, I think, as Rebecca was saying, I, as, as you look at this as states or, or counties or, or cities, at WNYC, right, New York City owns, owns some radio stations, and 
sure every state, uh, all your state universities have uh, college-owned stations, and probably in most states you guys have multiple um, state licensees. So it, this is an important issue to you in case you were wondering, saying, hey, I'm not a broadcaster. What is this? How does this affect me? And then, and then also I think in other bands in the past, uh, some areas I've worked on in the commission in the uh, wireless cable 2.5 band, there were um, – uh, not non for profit or not profit uh, stations um, some some owned by um, i think some were state educa- some were uh, i think uh, 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 state or county owned um, educational networks and that band was that, that was the wireless cable band and it was and um, licensees were encouraged to lease their spectrum out to to um, commercial to commercial entities so I think what rebecca's saying is you know it's important that you think about this. You go back to your state legislator and take a look, and uh, you don't want to, in two years from now, you don't want to come up short. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, this presentation mentions uh, uh, state laws, but Greg is right. To the extent there are any local-level laws mm-hmm. that would um, reduce your optionality in the future, we recommend that now is the time to do your due diligence there uh, simply because this could increase your options later. Um, and so finally, you know, in terms of next steps, we are um, working a number of processes and work streams implementing the uh, Job Creation Act and incentive auctions. Um, we're working on timelines. That's another question we get a lot. Uh, when will this auction happen? Well, we're working through that. We have announced that we hope to have a comprehensive NPRM out on all the different aspects of auction design and new band plans and a, a repacking methodology, more detailed rules on the three different ways to contribute, eligibility for contributing spectrum, all that we hope to have in a comprehensive NPRM in the fall. Um, but we've already taken a, a few steps towards that. Just on Friday, we issued our first report and order on channel sharing, which provides a high-level framework for how stations can channel share. Um, but because we recognize that channel sharing is a business relationship between the two broadcasters who are sharing, uh, there are a lot of things that are not in that report and order that we think are better left to the private sector. And to surface those issues and talk uh, through those issues with practitioners in the field, we're going to be holding a, work ch- a workshop on May 22nd to get input from the private sector and people who are on the ground who are seriously looking at channel sharing, trying to work through arrangements, and most likely encountering issues that we just haven't covered in our in our report and order. So anyone interested in how channel sharing would work, I recommend that you tune in. That, that um, workshop will be webcast, and an announcement on that went out on, um, I think, yesterday. And another workshop we have in the works is on the reimbursement for the repacking costs for broadcasters who intend to stay in the business and broadcasting after the auction. Um, And this workshop will start to explore how we should be looking at reimbursing those costs, what are the most efficient ways of doing so, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So I'd just like to close with... um, just an observation that we're very encouraged by questions that we're getting about ch- channel sharing, about formulating bids, uh, how to participate. We think there's a very healthy level of interest out there, and that's very encouraging for us with respect to how successful we think uh, this auction is. So um, if there's anything in here that I haven't covered, by all means, uh, Greg knows how to reach me. And um, you know, if there are questions, I'm happy to take them. I don't see any questions uh, right now, so um, thank you so much, Rebecca, and I encourage everybody to go back and take a look at uh, what laws are pending in your state legislator that might prohibit um, pro- prohibit the sort of activity that uh, Rebecca spoke about. And uh, please, um, if you have any questions, or um, give, uh, you can either contact myself or Rebecca, and we'll get you the answers. Thank you okay, so thank much. You. Thank you again. Great. Hi. Okay, next up, we're going to have uh, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Um, Becky Schwartz is an attorney in the Mobility Division, and she's going to talk about uh, signal boosters for increased wireless coverage. Can you get the uh, – should be here in a second. Here you go. 
go. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Schwartz. I'm an attorney in the Mobility Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau here at the FCC. Now, um, I'm here to talk to you today about signal boosters. The Wireless Bureau is always looking for innovative ways to expand wireless coverage in hard to reach areas without the need to build more towers and expensive infrastructure. Signal boosters are one of these solutions. Signal boosters are devices used to improve the wireless connection between a mobile device and the wireless network. They are currently used today. Fixed signal boosters can be used in large structures as part of an enterprise system to improve coverage in large buildings, as well as garages, underground transportation systems, and other areas with weak or no signal. In addition to enterprise systems, signal boosters are also designed for consumer use. I apologize, here is a chart of an enterprise signal booster system which can be used in coordination with uh, macro microcells and distributed antenna systems or pico cells. Moving on to the consumer oriented signal booster, um, they can be designed to be used in mobile situations such as um, inside a vehicle, a boat, or an RV. They allow um, cell phone signals to uh, extend their signal to extend signals back to the network while consumers are in, in a moving vehicle. A typical mobile signal booster installation consists of an outside antenna attached to the roof of a vehicle, which is connected using a coaxial cable to an amplifier and an inside antenna. Consumer signal boosters can also be used in fixed settings, such as inside a home or an office. A typical configuration includes an antenna mounted in a window on a roof or on the side of a building connected via coaxial cable to an interior amplifier and inside antenna, which permits communication with mobile devices used inside the structure. You can see on the slide here um, the configuration of a typical consumer fixed signal booster. Signal boosters are used to improve wireless coverage in hard to reach areas. You can see a variety of those situations such as in buildings um, or outside where there are natural obstructions or in trouble spots or just weak signal due to distance from the cell tower. Signal boosters are particularly beneficial in rural areas that do not have a lot of infrastructure. This slide depicts a rural area in Utah. The orange shows cellular voice coverage without a, the use of a signal booster. The yellow area shows extended voice coverage with the use of a signal booster. The total coverage area with a booster is 1,006 square miles compared to the 335.5 square miles of coverage with no booster. And as you can see, the town of Modena, which had no service before, now has service with the use of a signal booster. While signal bo boosters are very beneficial for improving cellular coverage, they can also cause network interference, particularly when operated near a cell site or if improperly designed or poorly manufactured. So here is a lay of the land now. Wireless coverage is sometimes insufficient in rural areas on the fringe of coverage, dead zones in urban areas, or indoors, such as in buildings, garages, tunnels, etc. Signal boosters can empower consumers in rural and underserved areas. They mitigate service gaps in buildings, such as healthcare facilities and educational campuses, and provide public service benefits, such as increased 911 coverage. Currently, our rules permit signal boosters, but only with the consent of a carrier. Consumer and building owners turn to signal boosters as one solution, but interference can, can occur if boosters are, are improperly designed or improperly installed or they malfunction. Our path forward to addressing interference concerns um, has been started with new rules proposed in 2011. The FCC is hoping to promulgate these rules to facilitate the development and deployment of well-designed signal boosters, resulting in economical devices for consumers that avoid interference to wireless networks. 
The key stakeholders, consumers, wireless carriers, and device manufacturers are all working with the Commission as we draft these rules. Uh, please feel free to contact me. You can see my contact information up here on the screen if you have any questions or call the FCC's toll-free number. Thanks. Uh, so, so um, Rebecca, um, so basically, if, with the signal boosters, you could obviate the need for uh, increased uh, towers in municipalities, basically? Well, that, that, yeah, and that would be the hope. Which is a big and zoning issue for, for our friends in the state and local governments. Exactly. I know that is a concern. Um, and it also is very costly to build a lot of infrastructure. So um, there may be companies that are located in your state that are concerned with these costs, and this is a low-cost solution to improve coverage in such states. And they could increase, they could, uh, increase capacity for their uh, state or municipal-owned networks as well at a lower, lower cost? Yeah, exactly. Fact. They're often used in government buildings, such as this building we're in today. OK, thanks. Thank you. Do we have any, uh, let me see if we have any. I didn't see anything coming. Okay, great. Next up, also from the Wireless Bureau, is uh, Jeffrey Steinberg. Uh, he's going to speak about co-location. Jeff is the Deputy Chief of the Spectrum Competition Policy Division. Uh, Jeff is a longtime FCCer, and he's a uh, staff expert on these um, uh, on Spectrum as well as these uh, infrastructure issues such as co-location. And maybe a few of you saw uh, Jeff's workshop yesterday on co-location. Um, so uh, for those of you who uh, saw it and have more questions, please uh, feel free to uh, follow up, uh, send some questions in. And for those of you who did not see the co-location workshop, maybe you'll have some questions for Jeff after, um, after his presentation. Let me just help you get that up, Jeff. Sure. All right. Um, thank you, Greg. Um, as Greg said, I am Jeffrey Steinberg. I am Deputy Chief of the Spectrum and Competition Policy Division. And as um, part of my responsibilities there, I oversee the Wireless Bureau's work on infrastructure issues. Um, and, and thank you for mentioning the, um, the, the workshop that we held yesterday. At, um, and at the end of the, um, my presentation and the, the last slide, there, there's a link to the, um, that, that, um, workshop is on the web, both the, the video of it and the presentations. I actually gave a longer version of this um, presentation yesterday, so that would be a place you could look for more information um, or, you know, to view the whole thing. I think there was a lot of useful information. I'm going to be talking about um, Section 6409 of the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act, which was enacted in February. Um, this was the same legislation that had the um, the, the public safety um, spectrum, the incentive auctions, uh, other things, but there's this one provision that goes to local government review of applications for co-locations, and I understand there's a lot of interest in that. So, nope. Oh, wait, that's not it. <laughs> what happened? Oh, just there. Okay. Thank you. Um, so just for quickly just to set some context, and I expect this is familiar to most of you, so I'll go through it quickly, but the context of the ex pre-existing federal law that, that governs co-locations and other wireless facilities siting, and the key provision is Section 332C7 of the Communications Act, which was part of the 96 Act. Um, what that provision does is generally preserve state and local authority over wireless facilities siting, both new towers and co-locations of antennas on existing structures, um, subject to certain limitations that are placed on the state and local governments in that law. And very quickly, those are that the, um, the regulating government may not unreasonably discriminate among providers of functionally equivalent services, um, may not pro may not regulate in a way that prohibits or that has the effect of prohibiting the provision of services. Um, the regulating authority must act upon all applications within a reasonable period of time. Any denial of an application must be in writing and must be supported by substantial evidence in a written record. 
and regulations of the siting of these facilities may not be based on the effects of radio frequency emissions to the extent that they comply with FCC regulations. And except for the RF provision, any um, challenges to a local government action um, under, under that statute are brought before in federal court or state court. Um, now, the, the other aspect of the background here is the shot clock declaratory ruling, which the um, commission issued in November of 2009. And that ruling, the, the major decision in there, which I'll, I'll cover here, um, interprets the phrase reasonable period of time in section 332C7, as well as the term failure to act, a failure to act being the trigger for an action or failure to act being the trigger for, for bringing suit for a violation of section 332C7. And the commission in its interpretation said that a presumptive, presumptively reasonable period of time is 90 days for co-locations and 150 days for other applications, in other words, um, new tower construction. And the reasoning for the distinction was that co-locations are unlikely to have you know, major effects on the community and based on evidence in the record about practices as well as um, you know, our, our own review, um, it determined that, that it made sense that those could be handled presumptively in a shorter period of time. Um, the presumption of a reasonable period of time under the shot clock may be rebutted in court um, by the local government or, or state government where the state is the regulator. Um, and if the violation is found, the court will decide what relief is appropriate. So moving on then to the new provision, section 6409A, what does that say? Um, and the, the basic core of that um, is the simple statement that a state or local government may not deny and shall approve any application for a co-location that's covered by that section. Um, the section applies to co-location, removal, or modification of equipment on a wireless tower or base station. Therefore, it does not apply to a co-location on a structure that is not a wireless tower or base station, such as a building or a water tower. It, it's intended for, for co-location on the, the wire the wireless structures. Um, it also does not apply if the action will substantially change the physical dimensions of a tower or base station. So that very quickly is what it is. Um, I just want to focus a little bit on the provision for substantial change in physical dimensions because that's probably the, 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 the most significant undefined term in the statute. The, the statute does not say what is a substantial change. It only says that if there is a substantial change, then it's not subject to this provision. So what is a substantial change? Um, I'm going to suggest that one thing that might be looked to for guidance in interpreting that term um, is the definition of substantial increase in size that the FCC has previously applied. That was first brought into place in our nationwide co-location agreement back in 2001. The nationwide co-location agreement um, governs our review at the FCC under Section 106 of the Historic, National Historic Preservation Act. And under this agreement, most co-locations that do not involve a substantial increase in size are exempted from Section 106 review, um, subject to certain exceptions. Um, we also at the FCC applied the same definition when we did our shot clock declaratory ruling. We had to define you know, what is a co-location that comes under the 90-day standard as opposed to another application that comes under the 150-day standard. And we said we'll use the same definition that was in the um, nationwide co-location agreement. If it's not a substantial increase in size, it's a co-location. If it is for purposes of that ruling, it's treated as not a co-location. It's treated the same as a new build. Um, so um, just the, the elements of the definition of substantial increase in size under the nationwide co-location agreement. Um, there is a substantial increase in size if the, um, if the new antenna or the modification to the tower increases the tower height either by more than 10% or by the height of an additional antenna array with 20 feet separation from the nearest antenna, whichever is greater. That would be a substantial increase. Um, second, there is a substantial increase in size if the installation involves more than four new equipment cabinets or one new equipment shelter. Um, third thing, there is a substantial increase in size if there will be a protrusion of more than 20 feet from the existing tower or more than the width of the tower at the height of the protrusion, whichever is greater. 
And finally, there is considered to be a substantial increase in size, so it's outside of the co-location exclusion. Um, if there, if the um, if the project will involve excavation outside the existing leased or owned property and current easements. Um, so how does 6409A fit in with these existing prior ex provisions? Um, it takes precedence over Section 332C7 in the event there is any conflict between those two provisions. Um, the very first words of 6409A are notwithstanding anything in Section 332C7 of this Act. Um, however, if there's not a conflict, then the two of them coexist and, and, and both can be applied. Um, and finally, there is a provision that explicitly states that it does not affect the FCC's responsibilities under the National Historic Preservation Act and under NEPA. So just to conclude, um, where we are is that co-locations on structures other than wireless towers and base stations remain subject solely to the prior law. They are not affected by 6409A, as are new builds. Co-locations on wireless towers and base stations are subject to the new requirement to approve and not to deny applications, again, unless there's a substantial change in the physical dimensions. Um, just my only thought on this um, and is um, we're encouraging um, the state and local governments in the industry to work together on procedures um, that will meet these statutory requirements and that will satisfy both community and industry needs. Um, there was a lot of this in the, in the forum yesterday um, that really everybody's trying to reach, I think, very much the same goals here of um, – you know, everybody's interested in having services to their communities. Nobody is interested in building things where they don't need to be built. Um, you know, everybody's interested in letting co-locations happen where it makes sense for them to happen. And, and we're really encouraging folks to work together. We're not um, eager to, to reach out and um, come up with prescriptive rules. We're, we're really hoping that, um, that the implementation of this provision is something that can be worked out. Um, I've got a couple of some contact information here. Um, Dana Beta and Don Johnson of my staff, who are both very informed and involved in these issues, um, feel free to contact either of them um, or myself. And also, as I mentioned, there's the link here to the workshop yesterday. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, maybe we don't have too many questions today because they were all covered in the uh, workshop yesterday, but I know I spoke on some panels, and I know this was of great interest uh, to, to folks there, so thank you for, thank you for making a presentation on this. Um, the, uh, the Wireless Bureau's infrastructure team is a great resource. Uh, their presentation is going to go up on the events page, so you could, con you could click to the um, – last page and contact any of them or you could contact myself. We work a lot with the, uh, obviously working with state and local governments, um, a lot of the issues that you guys have uh, involve infrastructure, rights of way, um, those sort of issues, uh, those very tangible issues I should add. So um, Jeff, thanks thanks again and I'm sure we'll be uh, working together in the future. Thanks. thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, and uh, next up, we're going to have um, my colleagues from the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau speak on uh, two uh, recent policy priorities of the FCC's consumer empowerment agenda. Uh, first up will be uh, John Adams. Um, he's uh, de he's um, Deputy uh, Division Chief in the, in the uh, Consumer Policy Division. And uh, John's going to speak about the uh, cramming, about the FCC's cramming order or anti-cramming, depending on how you want to think about that, uh, uh, that was just released yesterday. Um, so uh, we're very lucky to have John uh, with us to talk about this. And uh, without further ado, John, let me get you. Okay. So this one's hot off the presses, and um, I, I think you, you're, the folks in the uh, PUC offices, um, the state uh, attorneys general's um, 
uh, folks from AT's offices will have a, a lot of interest in this presentation and also the next one on robocalls. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, you know, speaking to an empty room, but I'll, I'll do my best to make it uh, as interesting Hun as possible. Hundreds of people out there. Got thousands. H h hundreds and thousands, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, the uh, item was adopted and released this past Friday, uh, April the 27th. Uh, so it is hot off the presses. Um, I believe everything is on the Commission's website at this point. Uh, I think there was a bit of a glitch getting it into the headlines uh, on the website, so you might not see it there. But uh, if you go into the EDOX uh, system and look at the Daily Digest uh, for, uh, I believe it was Monday, April the 30th, uh, there's a link to the uh, complete report and order and further notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, if you'd like to read the whole thing. Uh, just some preliminary issues. The effective date of the rules um, are staggered. Uh, billing system changes uh, are rules that require billing system changes uh, go into effect 60 days after notice that the Office of Management and Budget has approved uh, the rules. Uh, all the other rules will go into effect 15 days uh, after uh, that notice. And also, uh, for the further notice, uh, the comment dates uh, will be keyed off of uh, Federal Register publication. Uh, initial comments will be due 30 days after the uh, summary of the item is uh, published in the Federal Register, and reply comments will be due uh, 45 days after. And I also noted here, uh, in case there are questions, uh, anything that is at issue in the further notice um, is subject to the ex parte rules even right now. So uh, if there are questions about the further notice, uh, questions are good, but uh, comments on the merits of anything in that are probably uh, uh, things that you would want to shy away from unless you would like to file a, a notice of ex parte presentation. Okay, uh, just going over uh, the report and order uh, part first. Uh, cramming, of course, is the placement of unauthorized charges on telephone bills. Uh, they're usually third-party charges. They can be uh, charges from the carrier. And, of course, oh, thank you. Uh, they're often uh, fraudulent. Um, there's a lot of information uh, in a report that was released by the Senate uh, Commerce Committee uh, majority staff. Uh, that was released, I believe, July 13th of last year. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information in there about wireline cramming, how it works, uh, and, uh, you know, just the nature of the problem and even the extent of the problem. Uh, another interesting resource uh, are two uh, court decisions from the Northern District of California from 2010. Uh, both of those involve uh, a lawsuit that was brought by the Federal Trade Commission against a third-party crammer, uh, Inc21.com. Uh, so the, um, the sites for those are 688 uh, Federal Supplement 2nd, 927, and also 745 Federal Supplement 2nd, 975. Uh, so, uh, you can really get a good flavor from uh, those two resources exactly how crammers operate and get around a lot of the um, uh, protections that uh, telephone companies have put into place to try to address this issue. Okay, uh, really the basis for uh, the rules are that there was a finding that wireline cramming is a um, significant problem. A, percent, a significant percentage of third-party charges are unauthorized. Uh, that uh, is consistent with what we have seen from the complaints that have been filed with the Commission. And there was also a similar finding in the um, Senate Commerce Committee report. At the same time, we have not seen the same uh, problem or the, the problem is smaller, I'll put it that way, for wireless service, a commercial mobile radio service or CMRS. Uh, but at the same time, we've noticed that it appears to be a growing problem. Uh, there was some mention of that in the uh, 
Senate report, but our own complaint numbers bear that out as well. And as uh, was noted in the report and order, from 2008 to 2010, wireless accounted for about 16% of the cramming complaints that we receive. Uh, for 2011, that jumped to 30%. So we, we see that there is a growing problem uh, with wireless, uh, but uh, for right now, none of the rules that uh, the Commission has adopted um, apply to wireless. They apply only to wireline. Uh, the Commission intends to keep an eye out on um, wireless and also uh, interconnected VoIP uh, to see whether there are any um, uh, need for additional safeguards with respect to those services. And that's uh, one of the things that is uh, raised in the, um, the further notice. The rules that were adopted uh, amend the existing truth and billing rules, uh, which are uh, can be found at 47 CFR uh, 64.2400 and 2401. Uh, the Commission decided to adopt two of the three rules that it proposed in uh, the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking uh, that was issued last summer, and we'll talk uh, more about what those rules are here in a minute. Uh, there were a number of other questions that were raised in the NPRM as well. Uh, for right now, the Commission has uh, elected not to take action uh, on those things, although uh, some of those uh, make another appearance in the further notice, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, there are two things that are um, probably fairly important uh, to state regulators. Uh, and that is, first, there is no change to the preemption provisions in the truth and billing rules. Uh, right now, the rules do not preempt consistent state rules. Uh, there was no change in that uh, with these additional rules that were adopted. And the other thing is that the prior truth and billing rules apply to both interstate and intrastate services. The new rules do not apply to uh, bills that contain only intrastate charges. And the reason for that is that the jurisdictional basis for the uh, prior rules um, is somewhat different than the jurisdictional basis for the new rules. Uh, the old rules were based on Section uh, 258 of the Communications Act as well as Section 201B. The new rules are based solely on Section 201B, which is limited to the interstate jurisdiction. Okay, the rules uh, that were adopted. First, uh, for wireline carriers, if a carrier offers its customers the ability to block third-party charges, it must now inform customers of those options uh, on its bill, uh, on its website, and at the point of sale. Uh, this is really aimed at helping subscribers keep third-party charges off their bills before cramming uh, can occur. Uh, what we found was that many wireline carriers actually already offer uh, blocking services, but customers don't know that, uh, and they usually don't find out until after they've been the victim of cramming and complain to the carrier. Uh, so our goal there is to improve uh, the information available to consumers so that uh, they can take advantage of, of services that are already there but they just don't know about. Uh, the second rule that was adopted uh, is a requirement for wireline carriers to place third-party charges in a distinct section of the bill separate from carrier charges and also provide a separate subtotal for those charges. Uh, this enhances a requirement that already exists in the truth and billing rules to separate charges by service provider. Uh, but what we saw was that uh, sometimes charges for telecommunication services and not for telecommunication services uh, would be listed under the name of a single provider 
and that made it uh, more difficult for consumers to pick out uh, what things might actually be a charge for a telecommunication service and things that uh, may, may not be. And since uh, there was uh, quite a bit of um, information, especially in the Senate report, that suggests that uh, the primary uh, or the charges that are crammed are most often from a third party, uh, informed this so that we were trying to separate out those third party non-telecommunication service charges. Uh, we expect that this will require uh, wireline carriers to make some changes to their billing system uh, and that uh, this, this is the rule that will take longer to implement. Uh, and, th and this is the one that goes into effect 60 days instead of 15 days. Another piece of this is the separate subtotal requirement. Uh, and on a paper bill, that means that on the payment page, which is usually the first page of the bill, there will have to be a separate subtotal for all of those uh, non-carrier third-party charges uh, that are in that separate section of the bill to better highlight to consumers that uh, their bill includes charges from these third parties and that they may want to uh, take a look at those a little more closely. For an electronic bill, uh, this uh, separate subtotal must be included in an, an equivalent location on the electronic bill. And also, anywhere the bill total is shown before the consumer actually accesses the bill, such as in a, a transmittal email or a link on a web page or a link on a payment portal, anything like that. The idea is that the first time the consumer sees the total due on their bill, they will see that separate subtotal. Okay, the Commission decided not to adopt the third rule that uh, was proposed uh, in the NPRM last year. And that rule was, would have been a requirement for carriers to place the FTC's contact information on uh, bills and websites, and that specifically would have been uh, uh, the information of where to file a complaint with the FCC. And there were really a couple of reasons why uh, that uh, didn't make it into the final rules. And uh, one of those was that there was uh, quite a bit of opposition uh, from um, uh, state uh, commenters who were concerned over, you know, jurisdictional issues uh, and also from carriers who were concerned that consumers may believe that the first step they should take whenever they have a, a billing issue is to file a complaint with the FCC instead of taking that up with the carrier and at least allowing the carrier to try to address it before going to the regulator. Um, so in light of that and uh, the Commission's own analysis, uh, I think the conclusion was that there was a lack of significant benefit to subscribers uh, from that requirement and that uh, it didn't merit uh, uh, having the carriers incur the costs to, uh, to comply with it. Okay, uh, the next piece is the further notice, um, and it really seeks uh, comment on additional measures that the Commission might take to protect wireline uh, subscribers from cramming, uh, and specifically, uh, it asks about an opt-in requirement, and that would be something along the lines of a requirement that a carrier would have to obtain prior approval from a subscriber before the carrier could place uh, third-party charges uh, on uh, the, the consumer's bill. And th there actually was quite a bit of support for that idea in the record that's already been developed, but uh, there wasn't as much uh, information about the details of specifically how that would work. Uh, so we're asking questions about how an opt-in requirement should be structured and how it would work <coughs> specifically, what the mechanics would be. You know, questions like should this apply to all uh, subscribers or just to new subscribers? Uh, should it um, exempt certain kinds of services like a pre-subscribed long-distance carrier or should it apply to everyone who isn't the carrier uh, issuing the bill? Uh, you know, all those sorts of questions. 
and also how would it work on a day-to-day -day basis? How would the carrier uh, solicit uh, approval from the subscriber? How would the carrier make notification to the uh, subscriber of this option? You know, those sorts of things. And then the other piece of the further notice is to seek comment on additional measures for uh, wireless and also for uh, interconnected uh, VoIP service or internet phone. Uh, again, since we have seen that uh, uptick in wireless uh, complaints and uh, you know some the information that was in the Senate Commerce uh, Committee report, uh, the Commission wants to find out more about that and whether there really is a need or a growing need to, to address that, and also uh, with VoIP. Okay, so that's that's it. And questions? Um, I'll start. You know, I think the uh, I wanted to thank the uh, uh, states. I remember looking at the uh, cramming um, the uh, record when it came in. The comments and reply comments. I think the uh, states had uh, really helped us develop a good record to go forward with that uh, cramming order. Can you, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and maybe John, since uh, you're 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 one of the folks uh, drafting drafting the order, you could let the uh, states and localities know of the. Uh, Importance of um, of what they sent us, and also how that helps develop help helps inform us and develop our rules. And to ask them, we'd, we'd certainly ask, and I think John will talk a little more about that. Ask that you participate in the uh, further notice from um, uh, your state PUCs. You guys have call centers and are getting complaints, and it's important for us to know what what's happening at the state and local level. Yeah, we, we actually relied quite a bit on uh, comments from state agencies, and the, the comments really ran the gamut. We, we had comments from the, the uh, state PUCs and PSCs, uh, also sometimes separately from the, the consumer advocate uh, group that, uh, with the commissions, and also uh, state attorneys general. Uh, so that, that was really helpful. Uh, it not only helped to flesh out the record as to the scope of the problem and some of the um, efforts that the states were taking to um, combat cramming, uh, but also uh, it helped us figure out where we could best augment those efforts or the steps that the commission could take that would have a beneficial impact but would not, uh, you know, tread further into the state's uh, efforts than were absolutely uh, uh, necessary. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I'll have to say that the uh, decision not to adopt the third proposed rule was based uh, quite a bit, not exclusively, but quite a bit on input from the state saying, you know, hey, we need to think about this a little bit. There might be some unintended consequences here. Thanks, John. So uh, we we would ask that uh, yeah this, that the states uh, that you take a look at the uh, FNPRM and um, please submit comments and uh, help inform us. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I don't see any questions coming in via live stream uh, or, or uh, WebEx. So why don't um, you know if any questions come in later, you could email myself or, or John uh, directly and we'll be happy to answer them. Uh, let's move on to our uh, other part of the uh, Commission's Consumer Empowerment Agenda. Again, uh, um, an issue uh, not as complex as Spectrum, an important issue that uh, we all deal with every night during dinner time, uh, robocalls. Uh, this is uh, something that I'm sure uh, you, you guys get a call at a lot of the uh, state PUCs saying I've been put on the do not call list or whatever, whatever. So. Um, Kurt Schroeder, the chief of the Consumer Policy Division in the, our Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, is going to be is uh, here to talk about the robocalls order. Let me just help Kurt get set up here. Okay. okay. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. Um, our our uh, commission last February, February 15th, issued an order revising our rules that concern robocalls. Um, what are robocalls? They are 
basically uh, auto-dialed or pre-recorded calls, and, and it's important to keep in mind that those two categories of calls are actually very separate things. An auto-dialed call is one that, as the term implies, is, is uh, placed in an automated uh, fashion with uh, certain equipment um, defined by the Commission's rules and the, the Communications Act. Pre-recorded calls, again, are um, something separate, but um, the name is, is kind of self-evident. Those are calls where the message is uh, delivered through a pre-recorded, um, uh, uh, in a pre-recorded manner. Um, why are we doing, why did we revise our rules? Um, unwanted calls, um, telemarketing, and text calls are um, among the top three consumer complaint categories at the FCC in, in 2011. So we were hearing from a lot of consumers about um, unwanted telemarketing uh, robocalls uh, as well as texts, which are covered by the we're same. We're sorry. Your conference is... Which are covered by the same uh, provisions of the Act and our rules. Um, robocalls, as I'm sure you know, can invade consumers' privacy and in the case of calls to wireless numbers um, could use up the consumers' minutes. So um, they do have an impact on uh, consumers' everyday lives. The um, Act and our rules um, actually address robocalls in two separate ways. Um, one provision of the Act and our rules um, prohibit uh, all auto-dialed or pre-recorded calls, regardless of content, to uh, wireless numbers. The other provision prohibits uh, pre-recorded calls made without consent to residential numbers. So again, those are two separate provisions, and as I've just described, um, cover things in a, in a slightly different way. Um, what are our new uh, rules doing? They're doing four things. First, they're requiring telemarketers who want to make a robocall, either a, an auto-dialed or pre-recorded call to a wireless number or a pre-recorded call to a residential number to get um, written consent before making that call. That means they'll have to either get actual physical written consent or they'll have to um, get written consent in a form recognized by um, the Electronic Signature Act, which would include something like a web form um, um, signature or, or some other electronic means of, of, of uh, consent. So they have to do that before they place the, the robocall um, for telemarketing purposes to a consumer. Uh, the new rules would also eliminate the uh, established business relationship exemption to the requirement that telemarketing robocalls um, to residential wireline phones occur only with prior express written or prior express consent from the consumer. What that means is that the consumer will have to actually consent to a robocall to their home phone before uh, receiving one. Um, it'll no longer be possible to lawfully. Uh, make a telemarketing robocall to a residential line um, simply because the consumer has previously purchased something or made an inquiry or application um, uh, to the, to the uh, uh, caller. Third, the new rules will requ require telemarketers to provide an automated uh, interactive opt-out mechanism during the uh, robocall so that consumers can immediately uh, decide to um, stop further further calls to uh, to the uh, from that from that particular telemarketer. Um, again, this is a significant improvement uh, for consumers. Will give them greater control over the telemarketing robocalls they receive because. This way they can simply do a key press to stop further robocalls from that telemarketer rather than having to um, hang up, wait for the robocall to uh, terminate, 
place another call to the telemarketer and tell the telemarketer separately to, to stop calling. This will simplify things for consumers greatly and um, give them more control over the calls that come into their homes um, or to their wireless lines for that matter. And then finally, um, the new rules will strictly limit the number of uh, abandoned or dead air type calls that telemarketers can make within each calling campaign. Previously, telemarketers have been able to stay within the 3% um, abandoned call limit that uh, federal law provides by averaging that calculation over um, all of their calling campaigns. Now that 3% limit will be um, uh, required within um, each calling campaign so that telemarketers can't choose to shift some um, greater number of abandoned calls based on their predictions to certain calling campaigns and thereby uh, bother those particular consumers with more dead air calls than, um, than other consumers. So we're uh, looking at something that will, in general, give consumers, um, like I said, greater control over the um, auto-dialed or pre-recorded telemarketing calls that are coming into their homes. We are not um, changing the rules in any way um, regarding um, uh, non-telemarketing calls. So informational calls um, to your wireless number or your home number um, will face the same restrictions or, or lack thereof as the, as the case may be. For example, with, um, for an informational call that might tell you your, um, your flight is delayed, um, that kind of robocall to your wireless number um, is okay as long as they get um, some form of consent from you uh, prior to making the call, either written or oral consent. So, you know, when you buy a plane ticket, for example, if you um, give some kind of consent, um, oral or written, when, uh, when you make that purchase, um, the airline can then call you and give you updates on your, your flight schedule, that, that sort of thing. So, in any event, um, we're trying to maintain flexibility here so that consumers can get calls that are useful to them, but we want to make sure that the calls that consumers have particularly complained about in the, um, in the past and have done so in significant numbers um, will, not, um, will not occur when the consumer is not expecting them. So anyhow, um, that kind of summarizes what the Commission has done with um, robocalls uh, recently. Um, if you do have further, uh, further questions, feel free to call um, Karen Johnson, who actually wrote the robocall uh, order. She's one of the attorneys in our Consumer Policy Division, and her contact information is up on the screen now. Or you can feel free to call me. Uh, my contact information there is there, too. Um, if you want to actually see the Commission's um, robocall report and order, the link to that um, order is, is up on the screen as well. So. Great. And, and uh, Kurt, we do have a question from Lisa Colissimo, uh, who's at the Ohio PUC. Uh, um, Lisa leads our uh, state national action plan monthly conference calls uh, that, that we participate in, as well as the FTC with, um, with uh, state PUC staff. And Lisa asks, uh, please confirm these rules cover robocalls, auto-dialed calls, and text to cell phones, as well as landlines. First. Yes, that's a that's a very good question, and that is that is absolutely correct. Um, the rules do cover um, auto dialed or pre recorded calls to uh, resident resident. Well, excuse me, auto dialed or pre recorded calls and texts to cell phones, as well as pre recorded calls to residential landline phones. So, just to summarize again, auto dialed or pre recorded calls and texts to cell phones are indeed covered. And up, oh, you stole my thunder, I was going to ask you this. Are uh, charities and political type calls still exempt from these rules? Um, we have not changed the, the uh, requirements for political or charitable calls. Um, as has always been the case, um, those kinds of robocalls to um, residential lines can be made without consent without prior consent. Um, as far as calls to um, 
uh, wireless numbers, however, um, the law has been for, gosh, over 20 years now that um, you have to get um, prior consent uh, before placing a auto-dialed or pre-recorded call to a wireless number, and that is without regard to content, so that means that uh, charitable or political calls um, do need some form of consent. It can be oral or written, because as I said before, the written consent requirement that we've just adopted only applies to telemarketing calls. So um, charitable and, and political calls to wireless numbers, if they're auto-dialed or pre-recorded, do have to have some form of prior consent. Charitable, charitable and political type calls do need pre-consent or? Yes, they do. Okay. okay. For, 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 for wireless. For calls to wireless. For wireless. Right. That's right. Are there, good. And we could look forward to those in election season on our landline. Um, and finally, uh, Lisa asked, how do these rules change the purpose of the do not call list? The do not call list um, really will not be changed at all. Um, because these call, types of calls, either auto-dialed or pre-recorded calls to wireless numbers or residential or uh, pre-recorded calls to residential lines um, were always prohibited without prior consent. There was no need to put your um, wireless or residential number on the do not call registry in order to avoid re receiving those kinds of calls. So um, the do not call registry is essentially um, one that's aimed at preventing live calls to your residential uh, line and those types of calls aren't directly addressed by the um, new consent requirements here. Hmm. Thanks, Kurt. That's uh, very helpful. Um, so anybody else from any of the state PUCs or AG's office, or uh, we might have some friends with, from uh, the Federal Trade Commission with us today to, you know, if there are any other questions, I think now's a good time, or you could uh, email them to us. But uh, maybe you have something, uh, question, maybe your question is one uh, more likely than not that a lot of other folks have, but just are not asking. So I'd ask that you uh, go ahead and uh, send us an email if you have one. All right. Okay. Well, thanks, Kurt, and uh, thanks, John, uh, my colleagues in the Consumer and Governmental thanks Affairs Bureau. Much. And uh, this wraps up our fourth uh, state and local uh, government webinar. Um, we hope uh, this is these are useful to you. And um, as we sent out uh, emails prior to this webinar, you know, we ask uh, uh, that you guys let us know if you have issues that are are of specific interest to you, and we'll try our best to cover them. Uh, so please uh, let us know what you're interested in, and uh, we'll try to address them. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again in a few months. Thank you.